All right, it is November 21st. Um, this is week 11, or week 12 of engineering ethics at NJIT. Uh, this is week 11, uh, week 12, uh, and we're doing artificial intelligence this week. It's also Thanksgiving week, so it's gonna be a short week. <coughs> um, I'm actually gonna try to, the video might end up being longer than a class, because uh, I wanna get through all the material that I wanna get through since we don't have two class sessions, so I might run a little bit long, uh, but go ahead and, uh, leave whatever you want, Glenn. You've been you've been a great participant all all semester. As long as you get through the material, I mean, get the main important points. You know, let's just do it. Let's just get. Yeah, it. let's do it. Okay. All right. Let me go ahead and jump into the lesson here. All right. So I have a Prezi. No, no, no. All right, I have a Prezi uh, to use for today. I was able to make it uh, this weekend. Um, I am a little behind on grading. I expect to have the uh, mid, uh, the research projects graded by uh, the end of Thanksgiving break. So uh, thank you for your patience on that. So <coughs> my plan for this lesson, I wanna introduce the, the background of the artificial intelligence debate um, so that we can have a little bit a little bit of insight into the artificial intelligence debate and sort of talk about the state of the art in machine learning, artificial intelligence, uh, robotics. Um, just to get, sort of give us a, a picture of what, how things are right now and how we got to where we are right now. Um, the idea is to ground the discussion going forward in some real world robotics, some actual machine learning techniques. Um, because if, if I don't do that, then most people talk about uh, movies like the Terminator or whatever, her. Uh, most of our references for talking about robots and thinking about artificial intelligence comes from the movies. So it, it doesn't surprise me that uh, people want to talk about those, but I, I, I want to try to give some real world robots uh, and some background to have this conversation at a little more sophisticated level. Uh, so my plan today is to uh, start by talking about the history of computers and the history of artificial intelligence. <coughs> sort of uh, introduction to what computation is. Um, and then, uh, a very brief crash course in thinking in action, uh, in particular agency. So, you know, what is thinking? Uh, I have a uh, philosophy of mind class. Uh, it's STS 351, Minds and Machines. I'll be teaching it in the spring. Uh, that's going to be a, a focused philosophy of mind class. If you're interested in philosophy of mind, if you're interested in thinking or consciousness or whatever, uh, you might think about taking the STS 351 class with me. Uh, so, yeah, so background in the history of computers and then some general introduction to how the mind works. Um, and then I wanna give Turing's test, and I really wanna talk about Turing quite a lot. Uh, he's sort of my hero. I wrote my dissertation on Turing. Uh, so I wanna talk about Turing's test. I wanna give it as best uh, defense as I can, and then we'll talk about some objections to Turing's test, in particular the Chinese room, it's very famous. Um, and Lady Lovely's objection, which is less famous, but it should be more famous. Uh, my, my dissertation was on the Lovely's objection in particular. Um, so once we go through Turing's test, I want to talk a little bit about how neural networks work. I want to give you some examples of uh, real neural networks and sort of explain the artificial intelligence explosion that we're going through at the moment. Um, and then when that's done, I'll, I want to introduce you to some robots. I have a big list of robots on the Moodle website uh, to go through. Um, all right, so let's just jump into this. Uh, the first thing, first thing to do is to talk about the history of computing. Uh, maybe this isn't necessary for some of you engineers who have taken computer science classes. I know a little bit about computers, but if you haven't, uh, let me give, just give you some insight. I know some of my engineering students only have to take one computer science class, an introduction to programming class. Um, maybe you don't have the background, computer science generally. <coughs> so um, computing really changes in the 1950s. Uh, it really starts to change in the 1930s with Turing's uh, breakthrough in defining a Turing machine. Uh, but uh, culture doesn't really start to catch up until the 1950s. We'll see this in a little bit. Uh, before the 1950s, uh, computation was understood as calculation, the kind of thing that you would do when you're solving a math problem, um, uh, an addition problem, subtraction problem, multiplication problem. Um, and this is the kind of thing that people had to do quite often because they didn't have calculators and computers to do it for them. So uh, here is a want add from the New York Times, dated May 2nd, 1892. It was over 100 years ago. Uh, and for a computer wanted, 1892 a computer wanted. And this computer gets paid $1,000 salary a year. 
Um, and the requirements is that you know subjects like algebra, geometry, trigonometry, astronomy. And this is this is high school mathematics. Um, thousand dollars might sound like a lot of money. Thousand dollars in eighteen ninety two money is about thirty five thousand dollars today. So I mean, it's a real job. It's a real salary, but it's not a, a great salary. This is not high skilled professional work. Most of the engineering students, if you want to become an engineer, you probably want to be making more money than thirty five thousand uh, dollars. So so. so Computation back in the 1800s, before 1950s, was understood as this kind of job, sort of low-skill uh, labor. Uh, in particular, that computation requires no creativity or insights, right? So if I'm, you know, balancing the books for some company, I don't need to understand what those numbers mean. I don't need to understand if it's good for the company or bad for the company. All I really need to understand is how to add those numbers together, right? What, they're, what they sum to. It's a sort of simple procedure that I don't need to have any other insight in order to execute, right? So computation was understood as require, the, the kind of thing that a human being can do that requires no creativity or insight. Now that said, um, it doesn't require much creativity or insight, but it's still the kind of thing that only human beings can do, right? You don't get uh, animals, other kinds of animals doing complex calculations. Um, so uh, a unique human activity, but one that doesn't require the sort of the, vis the vistas of the mind, or it doesn't require the, the full powers of the mind. So you had this sort of low skilled labor, uh, but it was expensive. I mean, even, even though you have to pay them not very much money, not as much as a professional, uh, it's still expensive to uh, employ human beings, um, not only to take care of them, to, to pay their salaries and uh, benefits and whatever, but also because they're prone to error. Humans make mistakes. Correcting those mistakes is also expensive. It takes time, energy. So as long as we've been needing to do calculations, in any uh, systematic industrial sense, we've been wanting to uh, automate uh, computation, automate calculation. Uh, the first person to uh, really think about this hard is uh, Charles Babbage. Um, in the middle of the 1800s, he invented, uh, first, uh, first thing was called a, the analytical engine, and later he invented uh, an improvement called the difference engine, 1847. <coughs> and Babbage spent his life trying to get this Thing built, trying to get it funded and built. Um, he had the designs worked out on paper, but he didn't actually have a working version of it. Um, he was able to get some funds, uh, and he used those funds to build a seventh of the completed machine. Uh, but he was never able to get the full funding to, uh, to finish the machine. And he spent most of his life trying to lobby. Uh, he lived in England, so he was lobbying uh, Parliament to try to get them to, to buy his machine. Um, they, didn't, they didn't do it. Uh, uh, he never got his machine funded. Um, partly because no one understood why you'd want an uh, automatic computer. Because, look, you can pay someone to do that same job. Why would we spend more money to build an untested, unproven machine uh, that might just fail and might not work at all? In fact, uh, people contemporary to Babbage who knew of his work um, took his designs and built them built them themselves um, around the same time that Babbage was around. Uh, and it ruined their business. So they, so they built these machines, they worked, um, but no one was interested in them. They were sort of special purpose. They only had a few limited applications. I um, mean, so they just never took off in the industry. And the father-son team, a uh, pair of uh, machinists in Europe uh, who built these machines, ended up going bankrupt, losing their business, uh, and uh, dying in poverty uh, from trying to make these machines. So no one thought at the time that these machines were a good idea. Um, uh, and it would take another 100 years before we actually start building uh, computers that worked. Um, we could have had these computers around 100 years earlier before we even had electricity, uh, but that just didn't happen. Um, the one person who did uh, sort of take to Babbage's work was Lady Lovelace, uh, Ada Lovelace. Uh, Ada Lovelace was the daughter of Lord Byron, uh, the poet. You know. um, and so since she was the daughter of a lord, she was a lady, uh, and she had sort of aristocratic status. Um, she was the only acknowledged daughter. Lord Byron had a bunch of other illegitimate children, but Lovelace was the only legitimate child. Uh, that Byron acknowledged. Um, and so she had the luxury of living an aristocratic lifestyle. She had, in particular, she had good uh, tutors, and she had a very strong interest in mathematics. She was a very talented mathematician. Uh, and she had tutors that were able to sort of cultivate this interest of hers. <coughs> now, uh, Babbage um, was trying to build his difference engine. Let me show you a working version of the difference engine. Uh, yeah, so this is, this is the full thing. Uh, in the 20th century, we actually went and built, using Babbage's designs, some slight alterations, but nothing fundamental to the way that the machine worked. Um, so this is the difference engine. Let me show you, let me back up a little bit. Okay. 
yeah, so, so this is a difference engine. Um, like I said, uh, Babbage built a seventh of this uh, during his life. So he had uh, basically one of these columns and not even the full column, just a little piece of the column. Um, uh, but, but the, uh, the uh, difference engine, it, it's an adding machine. Um, if you know anything about computer science, you know how to build an adder. Well, this is just a really big adder. It works with gears and the gears are all tuned so that when you turn a big crank, uh, all the gears sort of work together and eventually it spits out an answer. Um, with this machine, you can do addition, subtraction, multiplication, division. Uh, you can also solve certain simple polynomial equations, uh, it's differential equations. It's a differential equations is why it's called the difference engine. Uh, so you can do some fairly sophisticated mathematics. Um, you don't have a lot of bits to work with because uh, this is an old machine, um, but, but it works. Um, and when they built it in the 20, 20th century, uh, according to Babbage's design, yeah, here he is turning the crank. They built it in the 20th century according to Babbage's design. It worked like he expected it to work. Um, yeah, you, see, you can see here the, as he's turning the crank, these little gear shafts move around. Uh, sometimes they lock into the gears and twist them in different ways like that. So Babbage had this design all worked out and it would have worked too if he'd uh, gotten it built at the time, but no one wanted to build it. Um, but as when he was trying to sell this to people and he's trying to lobby for it, he would throw these big parties and invite a bunch of people over and have them look at his various dimensions. He invented this and a bunch of other stuff. And at one of these parties, uh, Lovelace attends and Babbage spends a lot of time describing to her how the machine works and Lovelace gets it instantly. Um, she has a mathematical background to understand what this machine can do um, and she's completely fascinated by it. And after this meeting, her and Babbage exchange letters. Uh, these letters have been uh, immortalized and there's a comic on Lovelace and Babbage. Here's Lovelace and there's Babbage, the old inventor. Uh, here's Lovelace explaining to ba uh, Babbage explaining to Lovelace how a little bit of the analytical engine works. Um, and then in the comic books they end up working together to, it's sort of like a little fantasy comic about Babbage and Lovelace working together uh, to build a computer. <laughs> Um, so uh, Babbage sort of takes to, I'm sorry, Lovelace sort of takes to Babbage and they have this correspondence. And in the course of this correspondence, Lovelace describes a bunch of things you can do with the difference engine. In particular, she describes certain algorithms for computing different kinds of things. Um, in doing so, she really uh, writes the first computer programs. She's writing the first computer programs for a machine that was never even built. Right, so it shows you how far ahead of, uh, ahead of herself, ahead of her time she was. Uh, Lovelace is thinking, um, uh, really sophisticated ways about how these machines work. Uh, not only does she describe some algorithms for mathematical processes, but she even uh, imagines uh, instead of gears computing numbers, that you can hook these up to uh, uh, musical devices and compute notes so that you can have the difference engine crank out a song, a musical score. Um, right, so, so she's imagining automated music generation. Right? This is far advanced of her time. It would be another hundred years before anyone builds anything like it. Over a hundred years before anyone builds anything like it. I mean, this is this is the uh, beginning of computation. Um, because uh, due to writing these early programs for the Difference Engine, uh, Ada Lovelace is credited as being the world's first computer programmer, um, and she gets a lot of celebration for this. Uh, there's uh, uh, Ada Lovelace Day. It's in November. I think we already passed it. But Ada Lovelace Day is a day for celebrating women in STEM. And Lovelace is the sort of champion of this, uh, this celebration. Um, in fact, if you go through the history of computing, most of the early computer scientists were women. Um, Grace Hopper, uh, uh, Margaret Hamilton. Um, these, these are people who are, actually, let me show you the picture of Margaret Hamilton. Hello, my computer's running very slow. Yeah, so uh, Margaret Hamilton, um, early computer scientist, was the lead uh, coder for the Apollo uh, Apollo missions to space. She was a lead programmer at NASA, um, and she wrote herself the code that got the Apollo missions into space, and here is the code printed out on paper. So if you stack the code on paper, printed out, it's taller than she is, and she wrote all of that. Um, uh, early computer scientists, uh, early people who worked on computers, it was, it was considered a kind of office job, like a secretari secretarial job. So uh, it, men didn't tend to take this job and it was mostly with women. I mean, I mean women had a, lot, a huge influence over early computer science. Uh, Lovelace is just the first example of this. 
But Babbage never built his machine. We have to wait until Turing, um, much later in the 20th century. So Alan Turing um, in the 1930s, 1936, 37, um, he describes a formal, I and mean, he describes a formal process for computation. He formalizes computation. So remember, computation used to be described as what a human being can do without any cleverness or insight. Um, but what Turing does is he defines a mechanism, an actual physical mechanism, uh, uh, that you can build um, that will also do a computational process. Uh, Turing, uh, so th this uh, thing is called a Turing machine. Um, Turing builds this Turing machine in order to solve the halting problem. So the halting problem is one of these big 20th century mathematical problems at the turn of the 20th century. David Hilbert is a famous mathematician. Uh, he lists these, gives a list of these unsolved problems in mathematics. And much of the 20th century is about solving these, uh, these really important problems. Um, and one of those problems is the halting problem. So the halting problem is if I have some mathematical procedure, uh, sometimes those procedures end up going on forever, creating a cycle or an infinite loop and going on forever and other procedures end up stopping at some terminal state, the halting state. And so the question of the halting problem is, can you tell, if I give you an arbitrary program, can you tell whether that program halts um, or whether it goes on forever? If, if I give you a very simple program, you can tell, you know, this goes on for you know, 10, 10 steps and then it stops. Or this one is an infinite loop and it goes on forever. So you can tell in specific cases, but the question is, can you tell in the general case? If I give you any arbitrary program, can you tell uh, from that arbitrary program whether it halts? Um, Hilbert, who proposed the problem, uh, thought that you could and uh, was waiting to see what the proof for how to find the, halt, the halting state, what that proof would look like. Uh, but Turing in the 1930s um, shows that, uh, in fact, you can't, that the halting problem is undecidable, that you can't, in the general case, know for sure whether a computer will halt, whether a program will halt. Uh, some programs run on forever, some programs uh, halt after a finite amount of time. Uh, but there's no decision procedure for distinguishing the two. The only way to know is to actually run the program. And since uh, if it doesn't halt, it goes on forever, then you're never going to actually know if it halts, right? Because you never see that it, get, it gets to the end. So, so Turing proves in the 1930s that the halting problem is undecidable. It's a major mathematical result, Turing's uh, proof along with Gödel's incompleteness theorem. Um, it, it's, it completely changes the nature of mathematics in the 20th century. Uh, ma major results. Um, but for our purposes, the really important part here is how he goes about proving it. Um, in order to prove that the halting problem is undecidable, uh, Turing gives a definition of what's now called effective computation or effective calculation. Um, and he does this in terms of a Turing machine. So this is a Turing machine. Uh, it's an abstract machine, but it's, a, it's an abstract machine that you can actually build. And in fact, all computers today, your laptop or your cell phone, are uh, instances of this kind of Turing machine. So a Turing machine has three parts. Uh, the first part, the most obvious part, is the tape. A tape is the memory store. Right? It has a bunch of cells, uh, little cells in the tape. And on the cell, you can write a one or a zero. Right? So it can store a one or a zero. Uh, and and these, tape, uh, these cells are all like, next to each other in this long tape. And the tape goes infinitely in both directions. So the tape stores values. That's the first part. The second part is the read-write head, so this big square right here is the read-write head. And what the read-write head does is it moves along the tape, both left and right along the tape. Um, and then it sits on top of one of the cells and it can read what value is in that cell. It can erase that value and write a new value into that cell. And it can move left and right uh, to look at the cell to the left or to the right. So the tape has all this data and it goes off, off in both directions forever. And then there's this read-write head that reads the data, writes to the data, and moves back and forth across the data. So the tape, the read-write head, the first two parts. The last part is the program. <coughs> and in particular, the program is a finite state machine. So the finite state machine, so a program in the finite state machine uh, has a bunch of states, and the states tell you what to do uh, when you're in that state. So, so this is a full Turing machine. So uh, the way this works is that we're currently in state C. And what state C says, if you read zero on the tape, then do this. And if you run on the tape, then do this other thing. Right, so if we read a zero and we're in state C, then we do this. And what is this? Well, it says, first thing you do is write symbol one. So if we're in state C and we read a zero on the tape, then the first thing we do is write 
a one to the cell that we're on. So we change the zero to a one. Uh, and then it says move the tape left. So we move one space to the left. So we're here, now we move one space over. So now we're looking at the next, next space over. And then it says move the state to state B. So we were in state C and now we're in state B. One more time. Uh, on this cell, the input is zero. So what it says is change that input to one, change that cell to one, move the tape one space to the left, and then set your state to B. So the next read through, so the, you can see that the, the cell immediately to the left is also a zero, but now we're in state B. So the, the, tape, uh, the program says, if you get an input zero, if you do, and you're in state B, then write a one, move left, and then go into state A. Right, so, so you see that this is moving the read write head over to the left step by step. Um, and every time it does it, it changes what's on the, on the tape. So uh, the tape goes on infinitely in both directions. Obviously, you can't build a system that has infinite memory like this. Um, but this is, it's an idealization. Uh, the, every other part of this system you can build. You can build a machine that has a little read-write head that moves back and forth and it changes uh, the values on the tape. And then you can have a little program that describes how the head moves back and forth. All those things you can actually build in a real mechanical system. In other words, what Turing does is he gives us a mechanical procedure for computation. Turing tells us how to automate computing. So nowadays, when you uh, talk about computation, we don't talk about what a human being can do with no cleverness or insight. What we talk about now is what can a Turing machine do? Um, and computation is whatever a Turing machine can do. Um, again, we know that you can't prove that uh, a, a program halts. So one thing that a Turing machine cannot do is determine whether something halts. Uh, there's lots of non-computable or uncomputable uh, things that a Turing machine cannot compute. But computation is defined, what it is to be a computer. Computation is defined in terms of anything that a Turing machine can do. Any computer, uh, so uh, your PlayStation 4 is a computer. It's processing data. Um, a Turing machine, with just the little uh, description that I gave of it, uh, can, in theory, perform the same computations as a PlayStation 4. Um, PlayStation 4 has the hardware to do it a lot faster. But if we had an infinite amount of time, then this Turing machine can do those same computations. So you shouldn't be able to play a video game on a Turing machine. Professor, yeah. so what's it called? We start in current state C, then we go to current, and following this um, table, you go to B, the A, and then you go back to the, um, from A to B to C, and then you stop. <coughs> uh, wait, 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 so uh, when we're on zero in the current state, uh, of, C, is, of C, of C, because I'm assuming, C? C is the actual square. Right. Okay. So yeah, so this it starts in C, it goes to A, from A, it goes C, B, A, then A to A, B to C, and then it stops then. Well, hold up. So it starts in state C. Yes. And then what state C tells you to do is if you read a zero, then go to state B. So then it goes into state B. Yeah. In state B, it says if you read a zero, then go into state A. So mm -hmm. we go to state A. In state A, it says if you read a tape zero, go to state B again. So in fact, we don't go to state C. What we do is we just jump back and forth between state A and B. And as long as we keep hitting zeros, we're mm -hmm. gonna keep writing ones and bouncing back and forth between state A and B. That's what this little Turing machine does. Oh, okay, yeah, 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 because you're going, um, if you read, yes. It's, it's yeah. because, yeah, it's because that next state is B. So if that next state said C or some other state, if it said A, for instance, mm -hmm. uh, then, then we'd have a different finite state machine. Okay. Uh, this is a little bit complicated. Let me give a simpler example of a finite state machine just to understand what's going on here. It's not too complicated. It's once you follow the pattern. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, but it's a lot of sort of table lookups and pattern. And uh, the program that I, I gave was a very simple program, but if programs get even slightly more complicated, it becomes very unwieldy to think through this. So let me just give one more example of a finite state machine just to get a sense of how computers work. Um, so here's a finite state machine. This finite state machine describes the function of a turnstile. So like a turnstile, like if you're going into the subway, you have to go through a turnstile kind of like this in order to get on the subway. And in order to go through the turnstile, you have to actually pay, you have to put coins in, uh, or you swipe your card or whatever. <coughs> so we can describe this behavior of the turnstile um, in terms of a finite state machine. Here's the finite state machine. Uh, so this finite state machine has two states, the lock state and the unlock state. It starts in the lock state. Um, if you're in the lock state, and someone tries to push on the turnstile, if you're locked and someone tries to push on the turnstile, you're gonna stay locked, it's not gonna change anything. But if it's locked and someone puts in a coin, 
then you move from the lock state to the unlock state, right? So it's the coin that makes this transition. And then when someone, when you're in the unlock state and someone pushes through the turnstile, that brings it back to the lock state, right? So it resets it. Um, the way this finite state machine works is that if you're in the unlock state and you keep feeding in coins, nothing changes. So it keeps, so it, so it uh, just eats all those coins and you don't get them back. Right? Um, so this describes the behavior of the turnstile. Um, this is the, pro, the turnstile program. Um, notice that this is not uh, sort of binary instructions about how to operate a computer chip. Right? We're talking about very high level behavior about how, you know, you know when the turnstile locks and when it unlocks. This is high level behavior. We're not just coding a uh, computer chip. Um, in fact, we're not dealing with computer chips at all. There's not, nothing electronic here uh, that, we're, that we're making explicit. Um, all we're doing is describing this very high level behavior of the machine. Um, so this is the finite state machine that describes the turnstile. Uh, this is the program that describes the turnstile. Let me give you one more example of a finite state machine. Uh, a baby is a finite state machine. It's a computer. Uh, an infant, think, think of an infant less than six months old. Um, so an infant less than six months old, it has a few states that it's in. Sometimes an infant is sleeping, it's in the sleeping state. Sometimes it's in the crying state. Sometimes it's in the nursing state right, when it's eating. Sometimes it's in the uh, pooping state. Babies poop a lot. Sometimes it's in the vomiting state. Maybe there's a couple of other states that you can describe for the baby. Right, so the babies have these states, and when they're in that state, they behave differently. Right? The crying state is different from the sleeping state. The kinds of things the baby does when it's in the sleeping state are different from the kinds of things it does when it's in the crying state. So the baby has a bunch of these different states. Not only that, but there's transitions between the states. We can move back and forth between these states. Right? So if the baby's in the crying state, then there's certain things you can do to put the baby from the crying state into the sleeping state. If the baby's crying, you know, then you pick it up and you carry it and you pat it on the back for a little bit. Uh, you maybe see, sing a song to it. And if you do this enough, eventually the baby will fall asleep. It doesn't always work, it's not foolproof, but this is how you go from a sleeping baby to a, and from a crying baby to a sleeping baby. Right? If you can describe all the states of the baby at this very high level, the crying, pooping, and so on, um, and you can describe all the transitions that go from one state to another. What you've just done is you've described the baby as a computer. This is how we talk about babies. We, we right, um, you know, he needs to be put to bed. Right? Well, you have to do this kind of stuff to put him to bed. Right? We talk about babies in these computational terms. And right, so the point here is don't think about computers as ones and zeros, you know, signals in a, in a chip. Think about computers as state machines, moving around different states, doing different things when they're in different states, and then transitioning between these states. Um, <coughs> just, just, just uh, drive this point home. Um, if you're a computer scientist, you talk about uh, automata theory. Automata theory describes the kinds of things more sophisticated systems can do. The simplest system is just logic, it's just basic logic and set theory. Um, but if you add from lo to logic and set theory, if you add to that the transitions, state, state transitions, um, then you get a finite state machine, which is what we've, we were seeing with this turnstile, right? This is a finite state machine, this is sort of the first kind of basic computer after set theory. Um, the, the more sophisticated system than the finite state machine is called a pushdown automata. And pushdown automata are just finite state machines with memory. So in other words, a uh, finite state machine is exactly the same, but in a pushdown automata, you also remember what states you've been through. So uh, look at the turnstile finite state machine one more time. So you stay locked, and if you put in a coin, you go to the unlock state. And then if you push through, you go to the lock state. But in the unlock state, you can also feed in more coins. And every time you feed in a coin, you go back to the same locked, unlock state. So one of the things about this is that you, you don't remember how many coins you put in. Right? Um, did I put in one coin or did I put in 30 coins? Well, I can't tell the difference from this finite state machine because one coin gets you to the unlock state and then putting you know, 29 more coins also puts you in the unlock state. And so just being in the unlock state doesn't tell me how many coins I put in. In other words, the system doesn't have a memory. It doesn't know what it's done. And so it can't adjust what it does in the future based on what it's done in the past. Um, so this is a finite state machine has no memory. A pushdown automata is just a finite state machine with a memory store, so that it knows where it's, what it's done. So pushdown automata is slightly more sophisticated than finite state machines, it's just a finite state machine with memory. And then a Turing machine is an ideal pushdown automata. The only difference between a Turing machine and any other pushdown automaton is that a Turing machine has infinite memory, so the memory goes on forever in both directions. Obviously that's an idealization, you can't actually build that kind of thing. Uh, so any real computer in the real world is not 
uh, a fully ideal Turing machine, any real computer is really a pushdown automata. The turnstile is a pushdown automata. Your laptop is a pushdown automata. The baby is a pushdown automata. You are a pushdown automata. You are a state machine. You have a bunch of different states. Sometimes you're angry and whatever. You move between these states in some regular fashion. Only the Turing machines, they're only ideas because they can't be, they can't be, they, they don't exist as of now, basically. <laughs> um, no, uh, uh, Turing machine, so the, it's an idealization, and the only idealization involved is that the memory is infinite. So, so we can't actually build infinite memory, um, but we can build close approximations to infinite memory, right? Um, you know, the five, three terabytes in my desktop or whatever. I don't want to get into that argument. It's yeah. Not, yeah. Well, it's, so it's a like, mathematical argument. So. Yeah. That, that, that's really the only difference. But every computer that you've interacted with realizes a version of this Turing machine. Um, in particular, what, what it realizes is a thing called a, a von Neumann architecture. Von Neumann architecture is the computer architecture that separates out the processing from the memory. Um, and uh, in your laptop, you have a CPU, a central processing unit, and then you have uh, the RAM, the, the memory. Um, and then a hard drive, so long-term storage memory. Uh, this idea of separating out the processing from memory is von Neumann architecture, and it's based on Turing machine. And all computers that we, almost all computers that we have today are based on the same von Neumann architecture. I'll say that uh, the brain is not von Neumann architecture. Right, the brain does not have separate processing. Uh, does not have processing separate from memory. Uh, in in the brain, memory and processing happen in the same system, in the same medium. Uh, so. Uh, brains don't work exactly like von Neumann architecture, uh, but brains are computable, and that means that a Turing machine could, if the, I'll, I'll be generous and say, uh, if brains are computable, if you can compute a brain, in other words, if, you, if I can figure out what uh, the brain's gonna do next, um, then it's computable, and if it's computable, then the Turing machine can run it. Like a Turing machine can run any computable function. Okay, so this is a little bit of mathematics uh, background. Uh, Turing invents the Turing machine in the 1930s. Um, and once you have a definition of a machine, a formal definition of such a machine, you can actually start building them. Um, and that's really what happens. <coughs> um, immediately after the, uh, the 30s, um, World War II breaks out, and that sort of puts a damper on everything. In particular, uh, the British government asked Turing to join the war effort uh, to crack the Enigma code. Um, so uh, in World War II, Two, I mean, one of the reasons World War II is such an important event, it, sort of, it shapes the whole 20th century, is that more than any previous war, World War II is a modern war, technologically sophisticated, using industrial uh, engineering techniques, right? very, uh, very advanced stuff. It's not just a bunch of, sort of uh, barbarians beating each other with clubs. Uh, World War II is modern warfare, um, and that includes crypt uh, cryptography, right? uh, message encoding. And the Germans were very sophisticated at this. Uh, the Enigma code was supposed to be the most advanced cryptographic device uh, that was known. Um, it was considered unbreakable, and you couldn't break it. So uh, just get in here. Uh, this is the keypad, and you would type letters here, and then uh, up here would light up uh, the converted value. Right? So you press an E, and then maybe an R lights up, and so that means that you translate the E for the R. And the way that this uh, this encoding works. So each of these gears up here can be set in any number of, I think, over 20 different configurations for each uh, gear. And then there's three of these gears. So it's a huge number of combinations just in those gears. And then at the bottom here, uh, there are a bunch of plugs. And you can uh, arrange these plugs in different configurations also. So in order to do a decoding, you had to have the right configuration both up here and in these plugs in the bottom. Um, and then when you have that right configuration, then you plug in the letters. In, in the code, and then it gives you back the, the translated version. Uh, um, so it was insanely difficult to crack the code itself. And then on top of that, uh, the Germans would change the encryption every, on a daily basis. So that every day you'd have to set these wheels to a new configuration. You have to plug in new things uh, down here. So even if you, know, you spent 12, 15 hours trying to crack this code, and then even if you crack it, you know, just a few hours later, they're going to change to a brand, completely different code. So this is very frustrating. And on the basis of having this kind of strong cryptography, the Germans were winning the war at the beginning. They had uh, installed a blockade around England so that uh, the U-boats, the uh, submarines, 
uh, so that nothing could get through, and they were able to communicate with their submarines uh, uh, securely using their crypt cryptography. So the British government wanted to crack this thing, and they hired Turing to do it. He's the perfect guy to do it. Um, Turing uh, uses all the resources of the British government to build what's called the Bombo machine. Uh, the Bombo machine is a special purpose device designed to test all the different possibilities, uh, possible configurations of the Enigma machine. So the British government, they had a, they had a working Enigma machine. They knew how it worked, um, but the issue was just cracking it, uh, uh, reverse engineering so that you can decrypt a code uh, that you intercept. And this is what the Bombo machine did. The Bombo machine was a bunch of uh, gears that was specially designed to just do the uh, Enigma code, so it wasn't a general purpose computer. Um, but Turing spent the war effort building this bomb machine, and it worked, and eventually Turing was able to decrypt the Nazi codes. Um, and because they were able to decrypt these codes, they were able to eventually shut down the blockade and go on to win the war. So let me say that one more time. Uh, Alan Turing, uh, with his computers, defeated the Nazis. Uh, yeah, it wasn't just him alone, but he was very important to that effort. Uh, it was a combination, basically. He, yeah. If it was, if he did not, what's it called, uh, um, resolve the problem of breaking the code, oh, and including England, yeah, him in England with the uh, the bomb machine, not just the Enigma machine, um, then that would have played differently. Yeah. And I'm wondering just, I mean, modern skills, because you see that, and with that, I mean, now in today's uh, time, with those skills, I mean, that's very profitable that's very useful skills that people are willing to pay a lot for yeah because yeah i mean now you can basically you have control of any i guess coding and well there's different factors but yeah i mean and and turing yeah turing was the guy to set all this off he, he i mean he's he's a genius uh, his uh, his ideas about mathematics and then building this uh, encryption device um these are uh revolutions in each of these fields that he touches and he doesn't just stop there so after the war he's a war hero um, and, but he really wants to build a general purpose computing device and so he gets to work on that um, in England they build a machine called the ace machine um, which executes its first code in 1951 <coughs> um, at the same time von Neumann is working uh, with IBM I believe IBM uh, in the States um, and uh, von Neumann is a, fan, a big fan of Turing's work and uses Turing's work to build a similar kind of device in the United States. And shortly thereafter, these things start coming to market. They start, these things start being commercially produced uh, and sold uh, publicly. Um, so after he gets these general purpose computers uh, up and running, uh, Turing turns his attention to the question, can machines think? And we'll see in just a second that uh, this question of machines thinking uh, is at the very dawn of the uh, advent of computers. From the very beginning, we've been thinking about machines thinking. Um, and Turing is no exception. In fact, Turing sort of leads this field. So in the late 1940s, he gives a talk to the London Mathematical Society where he argues for fair play for the machines. He says fair play must be given to the machines. Uh, I'll, I'll give that argument in just a little bit. Um, and that argument uh, eventually turns into his 1950 paper, uh, Computing Machinery Intelligence. Um, and this paper is where he gives his famous Turing test, a test for intelligence. Uh, this... Uh, uh, Turing test. Turing's interest here is in dealing with the social impact of these computers. Uh, in the 1950s, these computers are starting to come out and starting to have a sort of public impact, and there's a lot of concern about them. They don't even call them computers at, at first because, you know, computers is a job that a person has, so they call them mechanical brains or electronic brains, uh, uh, thinking machines. Um, and these kinds of names, you know, uh, feed into science fiction fantasies and sort of scaremongering. Uh, people became very uh, worried about these machines, what they could do, what they, how they might you know, affect our, our world. And Turing felt some personal responsibility for uh, assuring people that these machines weren't dangerous, um, that these machines were helpful. So uh, these, these talks, especially his 1950s paper, which is published in a philosophy journal, it's not published in a mathematics journal, it's published in uh, Mind, which is a very famous, and widely read philosophy journal. And he's really speaking to the general public. He's trying to help the general public understand what these computers are. Um, later, uh, in 1952, uh, he also publishes a paper on uh, mathematical biology. Um, Turing uh, defines some uh, differential equations that describe the patterns of spotting that you see on animals. So, like leopards have spots, but uh, tigers have stripes, 
zebras have stripes. Um, it turns out that all these different uh, markings on animal skin uh, can be described by just a few sets of differential equations, um, where uh, adjusting certain parameters on those equations changes uh, from spots to stripes and so on. Um, and Turing discovered this way back in the 50s. 1952 is before we even knew about DNA. So this is very early in sort of rigorous uh, modern biology. Um, and Turing does groundbreaking work there, work that's still being used today to understand uh, biological systems. This is groundbreaking work. Turing is just breaking ground everywhere he touches. <coughs> um, Turing is also gay, uh, homosexual, um, which at the time was considered, was illegal uh, and, and a punishable crime, punishable by chemical castration. So in 1952, uh, Turing is arrested for gross indecency. Uh, what happens is he has a boyfriend. His boyfriend's uh, younger than he is, is like a 19, 20 year old, a young kid. Um, and uh, uh, they have a relationship, whatever, it's, it's fine, but the kid's sort of into some rough stuff. He has some unsavory friends. Um, and they make a plan, him and his friends make a plan to rob Turing. They break into his house and they steal all his stuff. Uh, Turing calls the cops you know, uh, to report the crime. Um, and uh, instead of going after the criminals, uh, the police are more interested in why these people were in Turing's home in the first place. And Turing just admits to it that he has a relationship with this guy, a sexual relationship. So instead of going after the criminals, uh, the police arrest Turing, charge him with gross indecency. Uh, it would have been a, a jail sentence. Uh, he would have been in prison for, uh, for a while. Um, or he had the option of going on probation and being able to leave prison. But the, uh, the cost of that is hormone therapy. Uh, where they give him a regimen of estrogen. Uh, and the idea of the estrogen is supposed to, is supposed to quash his libido. Right? So the idea is that uh, homosexuality is the result of a, of a deformed libido, that he has uh, sexual, uh, deformed sexual desires. And so uh, the estrogen regimen is supposed to change that. Um, what this really is is it's chemical castration. Right? They're giving him hormones to change his uh, sexual identity. Um, make his testicles shrink. Uh, now, and not only does it have impacts on his libido, but it has all sorts of impacts, right? When you change hormone levels, you have all sorts of changes to your cognitive disposition. So Turing grew depressed, he gained a lot of weight. Um, he uh, generally had a bad time. Uh, not only was having these personal health, mental health effects, but he also had all sorts of uh, professional impact um, from this uh, criminal charge. Uh, his security clearances were revoked he was working on high-level top-secret stuff, and all the security clearances were revoked when he was charged with this crime. So he was barred from working with the crypto community at all, um, and sort of shamed out of a lot of his, you know, professional career, where where he was, you know, contributing all this amazing stuff. But because he's gay, uh, he gets locked out of all this. And by 1954, he has he's had enough, and he commits suicide by eating a poisoned apple, uh, apple laced by cyanide. Uh, was there a possibility that he could get a job? I mean, I mean, yeah, so he got arrested for that. How long was he in jail for? Uh, he, he wasn't in jail for at all. He, he, he pled guilty and took the probation sentence, so he wasn't okay. in jail for very long at all. Okay. So, but, well, I mean, even after being in jail and stuff, he has, value, um, he has valuable skills, but now it's like, who's going to hire him now, so? Yeah. And he gets he gets pushed out of the community. Um, this yeah. is nineteen. Uh, he's he's only forty one years old when he dies. Um, he had a productive career ahead of him, and who knows what uh, insights we might have had if Turing had stayed around. But our our society is not uh, as tolerant as we are. I think it was just just recently, within the last ten years, that the Queen pardoned Turing and apologized for uh, driving him to suicide. Uh, but this is how we treat our our geniuses. Um, so <coughs> you probably know that uh, Benedict Cumberbatch uh, played Turing in the Imitation Game film. Um, and I just wanted to, uh, so part of his promotion of that film, he read this letter. This is a letter that Turing wrote shortly after he was arrested. I just want to read the last little bit of this. Is it not playing? There's no audio. No audio. Oh, uh, uh, 
oh, I don't know how to get the audio. Uh, the, 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 the letters in, on the website, um, so you can, you can watch it online. Okay. I would recommend watching it. The, the thing I wanted to point out was just this little bit at the very end. So uh, this is a letter Turing writes his friend uh, when he just finds out and he's about to plead guilty to charge of sexual offenses. Um, and he writes this letter in distress. I mean, I mean he's, he just got caught and this is going to be the event that uh, ends up uh, ending his life, right? This drives him to suicide. Um, and in, the, in this letter, the thing that he's worried about most uh, is what impact this will have on his thinking machines. So at the very end of the letter, he gives a little syllogism. Syllogism says, uh, Turing believes the machine thinks, Turing lies with men, therefore machines do not think. The idea is that because Turing said so, and because Turing's gay, then we shouldn't believe what he says. And if Turing thinks that machines think, then because Turing's gay, we should think that machines do not think. This is Turing's concern, right? He's, he's just got caught for sexual offenses. He's about to undergo chemical castration. And his concern is that this will give a society a bad view of robots, a, a bad view of competing machines um, because of, because of uh, his actions. It, it tells you where Turing's head is, um, Turing's concern um, about the social impact of these machines. Um, it also shows you how important the issue of machine intelligence is to Turing. Uh, good. So uh, with that in mind, um, yes, yeah, so this was basic, basic history of what is a computer. Um, I want to just give a, a brief overview of what, uh, of the history of AI. Um, so not just what a computer is itself, but what artificial intelligence is or how, how it got to where we are today. <laughs> and this all starts with just the invention of computers uh, along with Turing. We can start doing things and it becomes uh, early big commercial successes. So one of the first uh, computers is UNIVAC. UNIVAC is this Remington Rand uh, computer in 1952. You don't need the audio here. Um, yeah, so what you're seeing here, uh, this big machine in the background, um, all around here is UNIVAC. Takes up an entire room. It does 2,000 calculations per second. Um, that's a big deal back in 1952. Uh, your, your computer in your laptop is doing billions of calculations a second, so 2,000 isn't so much. But um, so UNIVAC is one of the first general-purpose mainframe commercial computers that you can go out and buy. Um, uh, private companies can go out and buy. Um, and in particular, the United States government, when uh, used UNIVAC for a bunch of different things in the 1950s. Um, in 1950 census, right, so every 10 years the U.S. does a census where it gets a bunch of information from all the people. All that information has to be tabulated and correlated and so on. And UNIVAC did that processing uh, for the United States government of the 1950 census. And this is one of the first uh, public interactions with com computers, right? It's one of the first computers that the public was even aware of, uh, was even talking about. Um, so UNIVAC processes the census in 1950, and then in 1954, UNIVAC predicts correctly the presidential election. Um, it is uh, Eisenhower versus someone else, and everyone thought the other guy was going to win, but UNIVAC predicts that Eisenhower is going to win, and UNIVAC ends up being right. And this is another instance in these early days of computing where these computers sort of make it into public consciousness and people start talking about them. And this is, uh, this is first computers have just been built, right? This is very early in, the, in computing history, right? So AI is right here at the very beginning of computing history. <laughs> in particular, the, the big conference that everyone cites is this 1956 conference at Dartmouth, where all the big computer scientists at the time get together and uh, sort of lay out a plan for artificial intelligence. In particular, uh, if we can build a finite state machine, a program that will get a computer to compute a function, then maybe we can get the computer to do other intelligent tasks also. So this conference was about uh, is it possible to get every aspect of learning and any other intelligent feature of intelligence uh, to be described so precisely that you can program a machine uh, to perform that procedure? This is the dawn of artificial intelligence, thinking about how do we program intelligent operations into these machines. 1956 is right at the very beginning of computation itself. And for the next 20 years, we had uh, the golden era of, a of AI, the golden age of AI. Um, uh, where there's a bunch of low-hanging fruit, right? Really easy sort of tasks to solve and getting a computer solving, you're the first one to ever do that, right? It's, it's sort of an amazing thing. So for the first 20 years, there was a huge amount of uh, optimism and uh, expectations um, in AI 
Um, and you had a lot of substantial progress happening really, really quickly. So within just the first few years, you have um, uh, Eliza, Eliza's a, a chat bot, a chatterbot, where you can talk to it, you can uh, say things to it, and it'll respond to you in natural language. It's not incredibly sophisticated, it's pretty simple, uh, but just the fact that there's this uh, back and forth communication that's somewhat uh, suggestive um, uh, of, of an intelligent agent. It's, it's a huge breakthrough. Uh, Eliza is a really big deal. Uh, Shirtaloo. Uh, Shirtaloo is a, a, a reasoner. So Shirtaloo, uh, it operates a uh, program that describes a uh, tabletop with a bunch of objects on it, squares and boxes and circles. And you can stack boxes on top of each other. You can put boxes inside of each other. Um, uh, and all they have different colors and so on. Uh, and so what Shirtaloo does is it, uh, it gives a little program for describing this tabletop environment and then manipulating in various ways. So putting one block on top of another and putting uh, the circle on top of that block forever. Uh, and then once you do some manipulations then you can ask Shirtaloo questions about that world and it can give you answers. So you can ask it, you know, is the red, is the red ball on top of the blue block? And then it can tell you yes or no. Um, or you can, you can uh, how many objects are on top of the blue block or whatever. And it can tell you that there are three objects on the blue block. So, so uh, you ask these questions in, Eng in English and it gives you English responses. Uh, it's just in this little toy world, but the argument goes that, that Chertaloo is demonstrating a sort of rudimentary form of understanding. It can understand natural language. It can give you proper responses to language questions. And one of the other early successes uh, in the golden age of AI is the Perceptron. So per Perceptron is a very simple uh, neural network sort of modeled on neural networks where there's an input layer uh, between some nodes um, and then the input layer feeds into an output layer <coughs> um, where each layer is connected to every other layer. And I'll show you some examples of these neural networks in a second. Um, the is very simple, one input layer, one output layer uh, program, but you can get this thing to uh, perform certain kinds of functions by, tr by setting the connections in particular ways. Uh, this is how the brain works. Right? The brain, your brain is composed of neurons. Each individual neuron isn't particularly smart, but you connect all these neurons together in a, in a particular pattern, and then you get intelligent behavior that results. Well, the perceptron works the same way. You have these nodes. None of the nodes are particularly smart, but you hook them up together in the right way, and then it can perform certain kinds of actions. Um, these early successes of AI spawned a lot of optimism, endless optimism, and huge amounts of hype. And so you see lots of the big names at the time this Herbert Simon, 1965, says a machine will be capable within the next 20 years of doing any work a man can do. 20 years after 1965, 1985, obviously that's not the case. Here we are, 2016, and we still haven't gotten that yet. Right, so Simon's way off, more than double off of his prediction. Triple, three times off his prediction. Martin Minsky, another famous AI researcher in 1970, says in from three to eight years, very specific prediction, we will have a machine with the general intelligence of an average human being. Again, this doesn't show up either. Uh, there's a video uh, where uh, Claude Shannon says something very similar. So uh, lots of researchers in the 50s and 60s, they were making great progress, but their progress was also building this uh, incredible hype that was unstoppable. And people thought that very soon we would have human level intelligence built into these machines. And that didn't happen. And because it didn't happen, uh, what we got for the next 20 years, what's been called the AI winter, Uh, uh, the thing that really sets off the AI winter is that uh, people discover that there's a fundamental limit to the perceptron, that perceptrons can compute some things, but there are some things that the perceptron, some computable things that the perceptron simply cannot compute. Uh, some very simple and very common kinds of computations that you would expect something to do, but this perceptron is just not uh, able to do it all. Um, the fact that there were these limitations of the perceptron sucked a lot of the wind, uh, like a, sucked a lot of the air out of the room. A lot of people were expecting this stuff to just keep pro progressing, but these fundamental limitations of perceptron uh, look like bad news. Um, uh, the hype bubble bursts, right? So all, right, all these predictions that aren't coming true and people just get fed up with it. And uh, there starts to be this stigma attached to AI research that uh, the, the researchers are really just in, in some science fiction fantasy and they're not serious researchers. Um, the programs that they're writing aren't as impressive as they think they are. And they're not making as much progress as they think they are. Um, and they're overhyping all their work. So this overhyping leads to a backlash, right? The hype bubble bursts and all the funding dries up, in particular the funding from uh, DARPA, the uh, 
uh, research and development wing of the United States military. And they fund a lot of research and they had initially funded a lot of AI research, but then once the bubble burst, um, DARPA pulled all of its funding and sort of refused to fund any AI. It, just, it didn't seem like it was going anywhere. It didn't seem like people were making enough progress. So funding dries up, it was almost impossible to get any of this stuff funded. A lot of people stopped working on AI. AI started, had the stigma of being sort of foolish and silly for a long time. And in fact, it doesn't really end until the 1920s. I mean, to, 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 to 2010, to the 21st century. Um, uh, not only does funding dry up, not only does the hype bubble burst, but you also get this uh, new wave of skepticism and objections. So we'll look at the Chinese room uh, from Searle, it was published in 1980, right in the middle of the AI winter, when AI is sort of the low point. Uh, in the 1970s, uh, Hubert Dreyfus publishes a book called uh, What Computers Can't Do, gives other kinds of objections. Um, it, and in, in this period of the AI winter, these objections tend to dominate, and people sort of believe that objection is more than they believe that machines will ever think. In fact, it becomes very common to uh, say during this time that machines will never think, um, and that all the optimism of the early AI researchers was just overblown. Uh, the reason I emphasize the AI winter is because there's this idea um, of uh, exponential growth of computation. Um, uh, so a lot of people have talked about this. Um, perhaps most famously, Ray Kurzweil, uh, who's now working for Google. So he has some legitimacy behind him. Uh, but uh, from very early on, uh, computer scientists noticed this trend of developing growth in computer systems, where they were rapidly increasing. Right? They just weren't getting better, but they were getting better really, really fast. Uh, uh, Moore, I forget what his first name is. Moore was one of the IBM researchers. Uh, 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 states the law, Moore's law, is that uh, the processing power of a computer chip doubles every 18 months. So, However fast your computer is now, 18 months from now, your computer will be twice as fast as the computer is now. And then 18 months from then, it'll be twice as fast again, and so on and so on and so on. You get this exponential growth um, so that the computers that we have today are exponentially faster, miles faster than the computers we had uh, 20, 30 years ago. Right? The cell phone in your pocket is way more powerful, can uh, process far more data than the computers that were on the Apollo missions that took us to the moon. And the computer in your pocket um, is more computation, far more computation, or does magnitude more computationally powerful than those early computers? And so the idea goes that, well, if this pace of growth keeps going, then we can just sort of anticipate where it's going to end up in the future. In particular, if we think that uh, human brain power is at some particular place, um, then we can find when the growth of computers ends up intersecting with the uh, capacities of the brain. And Kurzweil, and several other thinkers uh, put this period sometime around 20, 30, 35, 20, 45, when computers pass the intelligence of humans. Um, and uh, it's called the singularity, where machines are more capable than human beings. And the reason it's supposed to be singularity is because it's supposed to sort of uh, run away from us after that. Right? So if, if I have a computer that's smarter than a human being, then that computer can build the next generation of computers and that computer can build the next generation of computers and so on. And so, so suddenly we're outside of the realm of what human beings can even understand. This is the idea. The computers just rapidly outpace us. Um, but this is, not, this is not a very good idea. In particular, it's not a very good idea because computer growth is not as steady as we would like. Um, although processing power has doubled for a long time, um, recently, it hasn't doubled so much. It's really hard to pack more transistors into the same amount of space. Um, for the last five years, maybe even 10 years, um, yeah, 10 years, uh, most of the research and development in computing is not about more processing speed, but it's about things like uh, more efficiency, right? less energy uh, use. And these, these things are all important for building a good computer, but the rapid pace of Moore's Law seems to have sort of withered out. But more importantly than that, what the AI winter shows is that uh, the growth of artificial intelligence is not inevitable. Um, right? So you might think that right, this path makes it look like inev inevitability. It makes it look like eventually we're just going to get computers that are much, much smarter than us. And it's going to sort of constant progress the whole way through. But the AI winter shows that that's not how this stuff works. Um, 
although there was lots of progress for about 20 years, then there was a big backlash and sort of uh, very little progress for the next 20 years. And this doesn't have to do with, I mean, right, the, the progress here isn't inevitable. The progress depends importantly on things like uh, economic conditions, right? If, if we're in a bad economy, then people are going to be less willing to fund. And right? if we're in a, if we're in a culture that overhypes something, then people are going to be less willing to fund, right? so you're not going to get as much progress. In other words, the development of AI is not an inevitable fact of nature, but it's intimately tied to human social systems, our economies, our cultures. Um, and AI rises and falls with human social systems in exactly this way. So for 20 years, basically no progress, and AI was kind of taboo. Um, what brings us, we sort of start coming out of the winter in the 1990s. Um, in, early in the 1990s, uh, connectionism rises. The connectionists figure out that, they, they figure out the problem with the perceptron, and they figure out how to get around it. And the way you get around it is that perceptron has the input layer and the output layer. Um, the trick is to add a bunch of hidden layers in between. I'll show you how this works in just a second. If you had hidden layers, then you escaped this mathematical limitation. Um, and so uh, this, this discovery in the early 90s uh, brings some renewed interest in neural networks. People start working on neural networks again. And all of the machine learning that people are doing today, like 90% of the machine learning that people are doing today, um, came out of developments in the 1990s, the connections in the 1990s. There was other progress in other areas. Uh, Rodney Brooks and his robots. Um, I'm going to skip some of this. Uh, I don't need to go into too much detail. Um, in 1997, uh, Deep Blue plays Kasparov at chess um, and beats Kasparov at chess. That's a pretty big deal. Um, but none of this is really enough to get uh, sort of the resurgence um, of interest in AI that we're seeing today. Um, for most of the time, from the 90s to 2010, or another 20 years, sort of, there, there was significant theoretical advances, but this, it hadn't sort of popped into the mainstream. And it doesn't really pop into the mainstream until 2010 or thereabouts, uh, and really it has to do with cell phones. So the first commercial applications of these artificial intelligence machine learning algorithms are, uh, Google uses them to uh, do things like uh, uh, transcription. Right? So you can speak into Google, and then Google can turn that into words. Um, and doing that transcription, uh, the technique that Google uses is a machine learning technique. It uses a neural network. Um, and that process is in your phone. Right, so um, in 2010, these applications are coming out that have commercial application that people will be using on a regular basis. And once everyone, Google starts doing this first, uh, the video that I had, I didn't come up, but Jeffrey Hinton in 2007, right, so sort of in this era of quiet progress, in 2007, Jeffrey Hinton gives a talk at Google where he describes the next generation of neural networks. He describes how far neural networks have come. A few years after that, Google hires Hinton to lead their machine learning program. Um, and now Hinton is at Google, um, and all the machine learning stuff that we have is from this era of machine, uh, of uh, neural networks, machine learning. So the period that we're in, sort of everyone's interested in machine learning, there's lots of funding, lots of money around. Uh, people are doing all sorts of novel, interesting things. Uh, this is a relatively recent uh, thing, and if you've been studying AI for as long as I have, um, uh, it's, it's sort of a, I mean, it's interesting. Part of the problem is that we're making, we're repeating a lot of our mistakes, right? So there's a lot of hype about machine learning today, a lot of optimism about what it can do about uh, applications for all these machine learning contexts. And you see every day Google and Facebook and uh, Microsoft and IBM putting out sort of little variations on their machine learning software. It can do, look, it can do this new, new little trick um, or whatever. Now, all these little tricks, uh, uh, they're interesting. I don't know if they're gonna get us human level intelligence. And I'm worried about hype, I'm worried about overhyping stuff even today, right? An another AI which can come. Um, if someone makes uh, a, you know, a self-driving car that uh, ends up killing a bunch of people, um, it could be that everyone gets scared of self-driving cars, uh, all the funding dries up and people withdraw, just like they have, because they've done it before, we've seen it happen before, and it could happen again. Um, so just a little bit of historical context for thinking about uh, AI. Um, I want to give a machine learning demonstration, but before we do that, I should probably say a little bit about thinking in general. Uh, so we've talked a lot about what computers are, what AI is. 
Uh, but let's talk about what thinking is. Um, so for philosophers thinking about thinking, um, the traditional answer for what is thinking uh, has something to do with the relationship between experience and reason or rationality, or where experience are the inputs that we get from the world. Um, uh, Impinging, or so I, I open my eyes and light hits my retina. Yeah. It is an experience, a sensation of the world. Um, and then some processing on that sensation of reason. Reason is based in logic, logical truths, mathematical truths. And the idea is that I can know certain mathematical truths without having seen anything at all. Right? I can know that 2 plus 2 equals 4. As long as I know, you know what addition is and what 2 is and what 4 is, as long as I know the symbols, the axioms of the mathematics, then I can compute 2 plus 2 equals 4. I don't need any experience of the world. This is called a priori reasoning. Um, but some things that I know I need to have experiences of the world. Um, and so the idea is that thought is some combination of these two things, inputs and then processing. Uh, the, the canonical statement of this kind of traditional view of thinking, I think therefore I am, is Descartes in the 1600s. Uh, uh, right, the issue here is uh, what do I know? How certain am I? about these things. Descartes says, I think, therefore I am. And what he's claiming is that the thing that I'm most certain of is that I exist. I can't be convinced otherwise that I exist. How do I know I exist? Well, because I'm thinking. Um, my thinking gives me a proof, an undeniable proof that I exist. So, so here I'm, I'm learning some truth about the world, that I exist, that I'm thinking. This is, this is what you get from this traditional answer. So, uh, Philosophers, sometimes cognitive scientists, distinguish between sensation and perception. This is maybe one way of getting into this. Right, so sensation is what happens at your nerve endings. So your nerve endings are the input signals, um, and the input signals are getting inputs from the environment. So light waves hitting your retina or sound waves in your ear, um, odors in the environment, little chemicals in the environment triggering olfactory reception uh, so that you're processing that. Right, so sensation is this interface between the environment and uh, the neural system. And then perception is what you get when that input has been processed in a certain way. Right, so uh, I hear the sound, and then I think, oh, they're playing baseball. And I, I look over there, and I see them moving around, and I say, oh, they're playing baseball. Well, the input is a sensation, the sound that I hear, the experience that I hear is a sensation, but my thought that they're playing baseball requires not just the sensation, but also you know, knowing what baseball is, knowing that that behavior uh, is an instance of playing baseball, right? Being able to interpret this whole thing and applying all the concepts that I know uh, to these inputs, right? This is the perception. Perception is sort of conceptually rich, um, theoretically rich uh, processing. It takes place after the interface. And so notice, notice the arrows here, perception, sensation, perception. Um, and uh, the image here is sort of passive input of data and then some kind of processing. And my thoughts are the result of my processing. Um, well, what kind of processing can I do? Well, so sensation, perception, experience. Um, usually when scientists talk about sort of mental processing, they use the word cognition. So cognition is any, or cognitive science, is any kind of uh, high level processing done by the mind or done by the brain. You can think, uh, for instance, about sensory motor processing. Right? So if I think I wanna, if I think about raising my hand, and so I can have the thought I wanna raise my hand, and then I actually raise my hand. And so somehow that thought triggered my muscles to contract so that I end up raising my hand. Um, that relationship between what my brain is doing and what my behavior is, is sensory motor processing, action. Uh, uh, cognition also includes things like language processing. Right? So not just bodily movement and sensation, but also sophisticated language processing, natural language processing. Uh, things, anything having to do with memory, the cognitive process, remembering things, recall. Um, attention and awareness. Uh, attention and awareness is about focusing. Um, so you have lots of inputs. Um, there's, uh, I have lots and lots of nerve endings all over my body. Those nerve endings are receiving input from the environment um, and learning rate. Um, and I don't have the cognitive capacity to attend to all this input. So what attention is, attention is the cognitive process that focuses my resources onto particular kinds of inputs, particular kinds of thoughts. So I don't attend to everything. Some things sort of fade out of the background, like the air conditioner in the background. Um, most, 
I, I can hear it. I can focus on the air conditioner in the background if I want to, but most of the time I'm focused on something else and the air conditioner sort of fades away in the background. All right, so this ability to focus attention and to direct it at particular kinds of tasks, this is also a cognitive process. Um, any kind of mental representation, um, imagination, uh, any kind of mental, you have a mental image, uh, you know, you can imagine what Santa Claus looks like. Right? If I tell you, imagine Santa Claus, instantly you have a representation in your mind, it looks a certain way, it does certain things. Right? These are representations. Uh, representations are also covered under cognitive science. We've encountered representations before. Remember the script schema that, uh, uh, that Joya talks about in the Pinto case, where he says that he followed Ford's order, he followed the rules because that's the script that he was following. Right? So that script is a mental representation and cognitive science to study this, these kinds of things. Under cognition. Not just the scripts that we follow, but also things like our self-model. So I have a model of my body, for instance. Um, in particular, I have a model of the way that my body is oriented in space. Um, so uh, there's a representation in my mind of how my body is oriented. So I know, for instance, if, if I'm off balance, say, so sometimes I'm balanced, sometimes I'm off balance. And uh, there's a representation in my brain that represents my balance, and it, you know, it signals when it's off balance. And when that signal happens, then I make adjustments to get back on balance. Right, so these kinds of adjustments to representations, this is all cognition. Uh, one interesting thing, I don't know if you're aware of this, but there's a default network in the brain, it's a default mode network. Um, this is a, so the brain has a bunch of little functional units uh, that are specialized for different kinds of processing. And these functional units all connect up with each other. Um, and some of these units are very specialized. You, you, this, this part of the brain only lights up when you're doing this kind of task. But other parts of the brain are sort of always active, and this is the default mode network. So there's several parts of your brain that are sort of processing in the background no matter what you're doing. And there's always active in every activity. Uh, and that's the default mode network. That's part of your cognitive process. This is part of how the brain works. Cognition is really about mental processing. There's other kinds of mental states, mental events that we talk about, things like emotion, affect. Affect is like uh, the way I'm expressing myself or uh, pre presenting myself. Right? So if I'm angry, I have the emotion of anger, I have an affect, I behave a certain way because I'm angry. I, we'd say this is all part of per mental state, personality, this kind of stuff. Um, but usually we don't talk about that as cognitive because it's not sort of explicitly, uh, sort of explicit manipulation. Emotions have a lot more to do with um, uh, uh, neurochemicals and neurotransmitters and so on, um, that you have a balance of chemicals in the brain. Uh, and it's not exactly the same as the processing of signals by the neurons. There's relationships, but they're not exactly the same. So sometimes there's a sort of separation between the cognitive aspects of the mind and these sort of other mental states. Uh, but scientists study emotion also, study affect also, in psychology. Um, so this is all scientific stuff. Everything listed here uh, is uh, understood fairly well from a scientific perspective about how the brain works. And there's, there's still mysteries, lots of mysteries to resolve, but we have, the cognitive science is fairly mature, especially about these kinds of things. There are other kinds of mental events that um, are less uh, easily talked about in a scientific concept, uh, context. Um, the, the, the kingpin of these kinds of concepts is consciousness. So everyone, everyone talks about consciousness. Uh, at the AI conference I was at a few weeks ago, um, consciousness was a constant. Uh, uh, worry that people would talk about consciousness all the time. Um, and you have a lot of people say things like, you know, machines can't be conscious or the, uh, machines can't have consciousness. Uh, so part of the thing that's confusing about this is that people mean different things by consciousness. So when a philosopher says something's conscious, um, what a philosopher usually means is uh, what they call the hard problem of consciousness, um, which is the qualitative, the qualitative, the nature of the experience, what it's like to have that experience. So for instance, um, imagine the taste of pineapple. If you've had pineapple before, you know what pineapple tastes like. And it's a unique taste, it's specific to pineapple. Uh, it tastes different from you know, pomegranate or whatever, but it tastes different from an orange. But I can't describe to you really what a pineapple tastes like. I mean, I can, I can give you a description of it, but it's, it's not gonna be adequate. It's not gonna inform you about what a pineapple tastes like. Uh, you, you often hear people have these kinds of conversations um, around the bong when they're, uh, talking about color, right? So uh, does a blind person know what it's like to see red? If you've been blind from birth, do you know what it's like to see red? And if you don't know what it's like to see red, can I ever describe to you what it's like to see red? 
you know, maybe your internal perspective on red is different from my perspective on red, or maybe we have different experiences. From it's a different crazy idea, just what's it called? This, how you see a different red versus me seeing a different red. It's just, and how we have to correlate that and stuff. And then that kind of thinks, not to inter sorry to interrupt you, but nope. in bringing the philosophy um, part of it, where is this concept of, I think I brought this up in the middle, of what, what is the truth? What is red? basically. Yeah, I mean, so we know red is a wavelength of light, 700, nan 700 nanometers. Mm -hmm. So any light, or any, any uh, light that is at that wavelength is going to be considered red. Um, now, you might not see that wavelength because maybe you're colorblind, right? Maybe you don't have any cones in your eyes, and so you can't see, you can't process that color, you can't distinguish it from the other colors. Um, uh, but, but, uh, uh, for a philosopher, it's it's even more difficult than that. So I know that the cones in my eyes allow me to see red. Um, I also know that you have cones in your eyes. So maybe it's a good assumption, or it's, it's maybe that implies that the way that you see red is the same as that I see red, because look, the mechanisms that you use to see red are the same as the mechanisms that I use to see, to see red. We're both using these little cones in our eyes. But the philosopher's going to say, well, but just because I know the way that the outside works doesn't mean the way I, I know what it's like on the inside. Right? So you might have all the same physical parts but maybe your experience is still different from mine. And the challenge is that I can't tell from the outside. So the philosophers call this problem of other minds is I can't tell from the outside whether or not you're conscious. I, I suspect you're conscious. It makes sense that you'd be conscious because I'm conscious and you and me are pretty close, closely similar. The evidence I, is there, but to like honestly 100% no raises up a big question. Yeah. And, and a, lot of, a lot of philosophers just say you can't know. And so there's something... Mysterious. Not only can't you know, but you can't give a description that'll allow anyone else to know. So, um, so in this sense, uh, some philosophers think that uh, you can't give a scientific account of consciousness because I can't actually know if the account works for me the same way that it works for you. So uh, for these reasons, philosophers tend to think that there's a uh, kind of tension between science on the one hand, science trying to pr uh, provide descriptions of everything, trying to explain how everything works, and then consciousness, which seems to be this kind of thing that you can't describe you can't explain. And so a lot of philosophers worry that you can't give a scientific explanation of consciousness. Now, uh, philosophers worry about that, and that's mostly because philosophers just don't read science. Because if you go into cognitive science, cognitive scientists talk about consciousness a lot, but they mean something different. Uh, what scientists mean when they talk about consciousness is really um, awareness, the, sort of the focus of awareness, right? So what am I attending to right now? Um, so you have like little experiments where I'm in like an fMRI machine sort of scanning my brain and then I'm looking at a, uh, at a screen and then every once in a while a screen on the screen a dot appears and the task is to press a button every time I see a dot. And so uh, you get all these records of me pressing these buttons when I see a dot and then you also know when you showed the dot and so sometimes I might be pressing a button when the dot's not there. You know, I have an experience uh, but in fact there's nothing in the world. Um, and this is how uh, scientists talk about consciousness. Consciousness is that experience that you have uh, that generates action. Um, in particular, <coughs> we're starting to understand that um, consciousness is really about the integration of the network. So when you're aware of something, so uh, you know, I'm looking at the screen, I don't see anything, and then suddenly I see a dot, and I'm aware of a dot there. Um, uh, what that awareness amounts to is the bringing in of other functional resources. So again, you have a bunch of uh, parts of the brain that do different functions, um, and usually they're off doing their own functions by themselves. But when consciousness comes into play, there's this focus of all these disparate resources on a single task. And it's this focus of resources on a task that is characteristic of consciousness, the way the cognitive scientists talk about it. Right, so, uh, you know, when I'm in the zone, you know, when I'm, you know, writing a paper, sometimes writing a paper is really hard and I'm sitting staring at a blank screen and I don't know what to write. Or, you know, I'm looking through the material and I, I just don't feel like I'm writing or I'm, you know, struggling with a word and every time I write the sentence it comes out wrong and I don't know how to fix it. And there's sort of the struggle. Uh, but then sometimes I'm writing a paper and I'm in the zone and I'm just, words are flowing out and I'm filling pages really quickly. Uh, uh, when I'm in the zone like this, um, uh, part of what's happened is that all my resources, all my processing is sort of tuned to the task at hand. Um, 
Whereas sometimes, you know, I'm distracted, there's other things going on, but when I'm in the zone, everything's focused. And this is the characteristic of consciousness. So um, all these functional parts, um, what you see when someone's conscious, consciously aware of something is you see that these functional parts are more tightly integrated with each other. There's uh, stronger connections between these functional parts than there was uh, when, uh, when there uh, uh, was no conscious awareness. So the big challenge for philosophers and cognitive scientists is to try to ho hook up these two notions. Cognitive science, this focus of resources, that can be given a scientific explanation, right? How does the brain, you know, take all its different capacities and bring them together to solve a single task? That's the kind of thing that a scientist should be able to explain by talking about the brain. Um, but the issue is how do you hook up that integration of cognitive resources with what it's like to experience something? And this is what philosophers call the hard problem. So even if we get the full cognitive scientist explanation, we still have these sort of philosophical worries uh, to address. Consciousness here is qualia, the qualitative experience. Um, people also talk about self-awareness, self-consciousness. Awareness, self-awareness is just awareness of self. Self-consciousness is just consciousness of self. Where self here is one of the representations that you have in your brain. Or you have a self-model. Your self-model tells you what, what your body's doing. If it's off balance, you know, where, the position of your arms and legs and so on. Um, so awareness of self is just integrating that self into the model of awareness that you have. Self-consciousness is just integrating the self into the model of consciousness that you have. So uh, imagine I'm shooting free throws. Uh, I'm trying to sink free throws at a basketball hoop. Um, you know, and I'm in the zone, I'm, I'm shooting these free throws, and then someone comes in to start watching me. And now it's, I'm not just shooting the free throw, but I'm also thinking about what this person is thinking about me and so now there's other things involved in my cognitive process. Now I'm also thinking about, you know, what do I look like? You know, what, what does that person think I look like? And, you know, are they judging me for how I look? You know, am I shooting it right? Is my, is my form off? Are they judging me for that? And all of these things are the result of this new person coming in to watch me. I become self-conscious because suddenly myself is an issue for what I'm doing. It wasn't before when no one was watching me. I could just, the only issue was sinking the baskets, but it's when someone else comes in to watch me, now there's another issue. And the issue is, you know, about me and also about my relationship with that person. Right? These things start to matter and they can, and, uh, you know, if, if you're not careful about it, they can sort of overcome your capacity. So I, I might become too self-conscious and start, you know, missing all my throws because now I'm thinking about all this other stuff. Um, and the issue here is the self-consciousness is consciousness of self, where the self-model gets integrated into the rest of this processing. Uh, this is a very brief overview. There's a ton more to say about all this stuff. This is supposed to be just a, sort of introduction to the various ways we talk about the mind, especially from a philosophical perspective. I mean, how does this link on to uh, other kinds of conversations in, in science? I mean, the point here is not to resolve any of these issues, just to sort of throw a bunch of stuff on the table so we can talk about whether or not machines can think. The really important point I want to make here, though, is that this whole picture of thinking is really grounded in this sort of passive receptive model where what I'm doing where what I'm doing is I'm observing the world and observing the world means taking inputs and then processing those inputs in some way and what I want to say is that this is actually a, a bad way of thinking about thinking that thinking is not a passive receptive process like this but in fact thinking is an active process um, and the better way of thinking about thinking is that what thinking does is it exerts control in a feedback loop Thinking is a way of exerting control uh, uh, on a system in order to get it to accomplish its goals. So uh, don't think about minds to begin with. Think about agents. Agents are things that do something. An agent does some task. Um, an artificial agent, like a, a software program, does some task. My, my alarm clock wake me, it goes off at 6 o'clock in the morning to wake me up. That's, that's some task. Uh, and my alarm clock is an agent that does that task. Um, so agents have tasks. Tasks are described in terms of their goals, right? There's some goal state you're trying to get to. And so the agent's job is to get to that goal state. The agent's job is to control their behavior so that they're more likely to reach their goal. And this is in the form of a feedback loop. So it's not just input and processing, but it's input processing, and that processing prepares me to do something, to take an action. And then not only do I take that action, but that action has an impact on the environment, and I sense that impact, right? So, uh, so I, I sense the world, I process, I act on the world, um, and then the results of my action change the world, 
and then I resense, I, I get a new reading of the world to uh, see, see how, how things change. And I use these changes to adjust my behavior next time. Right, so every action, right, so there's this, loop, so let me show the picture. Right, so there's this loop where the environment yields some sensation and the sensation gets processed some way. And then that processing yields an action, you do something. And that action changes the environment. And then you sense the environment again, right? So this is the feedback loop from action to environment and back again. Right, it's not just passive perception, but it's active engagement. Um, and uh, uh, in the system, the agent is not trying to get the most accurate picture of the world. Right? The point is not to know exactly what's going on in the world. Instead, the point is to accomplish your goals, whatever they are. Right? Do whatever it takes to get to your end state. And the brain is the control system for doing this. What we're thinking is what the nervous system is. The nervous system is the control system for the body. I might have said this in this class before, but let me, let me just say it one more time. Uh, there's a couple of different kinds of control systems in the body. Um, one of the control systems is uh, uh, chemical control. So your endocrine system, you have a bunch of lymph, lymph nodes, you have a bunch of glands all over the place. These release chemicals into your body and those chemicals have all sorts of impact on your body. Right? The endocrine system. Endocrine system is a signaling system, it's a control system. Right? When those chemicals get to certain parts of your body, it makes your body perform differently, behave differently. Uh, but the thing about chemical signals is that they're very slow. You put them in a fluid and you have to wait for it to move you know, slow down, you know, the veins or whatever until it gets to its uh, destination. And uh, if you're working with liquids like this, it's a, the diffusion is a very slow process. Uh, the endocrine system is a very slow process. The nervous system is not chemical signals, it's electrical signals. A little bit of chemical signals in the synapse between the uh, neurons, um, but the neurons are basically electrical devices, right? They're transmitting electricity, and electrical signals move very fast, much faster than chemical signals. The brain evolved, the nervous system evolved in animals uh, to provide a faster control system, a control system that allows it to react to its environment and do things. Right? Plants don't have a nervous system. They do have a chemical control system, but then it's very slow. Uh, yeah, I, I, you know, a plant can send out signals that say that it's being harmed, and other nearby plants can use those signals to you know, produce more defenses. But if I'm mowing the lawn, uh, there's not enough time between, you know, when the blades hit uh, for the signals to get sent. Uh, so plants just move too slow. Animals, genuine animals, have nervous systems, and the nervous systems allow them to move much faster. So thinking is acting about goal acquisition. Uh, uh, Daniel Dennett quotes a uh, playwright. I forget who the playwright is, but uh, it says, the task of the mind is to create a future. Or put the mind is doing, it's not just trying to assess what is true about the world, but what the mind is trying to do is trying to build a world. It's trying to do things so that the world changes its state. You know, I'm hungry, and uh, I know that if I go to the kitchen and make a sandwich, then I will no longer be hungry. Right? So uh, performing that action changes the state of the world. I don't like it when I'm hungry. I'd rather be in the state where I'm not hungry, and performing this, this action allows me to get into the state that I want to be in. Can you repeat that? Uh, not the example, but the statement again. That the task of a mind is to create a future? Yeah, not based on truth, but just to, it's almost like you're saying, kind of just to aware, be aware of a conscience. Yeah, so, good. Um, uh, when Descartes uh, has, I think, therefore I am, uh, okay. Where this is sometimes described as the Cartesian theater. So we have this perception. Uh, the idea, the idea that Descartes gives us, is that you know, here's my body. I'm looking at the egg that I'm frying, and then what my mind does is it creates perception. So here, this screen inside is the perception. This is my mental idea of the fried egg, and then what thinking is is about dealing with this perception. So on Descartes' view, I take inputs, I construct concepts in my brain. And then all of thinking is about manipulating these concepts in my brain, right? So there's the fried egg out in the world, but I'm not really dealing with the fried egg. What I'm really dealing with is my concept of the fried egg that appears in consciousness, right? So, uh, it, so on Descartes' view, and in some sense, I'm, I'm sort of trapped in my mind. This is problematic because look, it, so if I, have this, if I have a concept of the fried egg in my mind, then who's perceiving that concept? And this is what the fried egg, right? So here's the egg in the world, light waves come from the egg, to my mind, and then I have a mental idea of the fried egg, or I have a mental image of the fried egg. 
It's, we say it's an image. But who's looking at that image? It's not me. I'm looking at the fried egg out in the world. Who's looking at the image in my mind? Well, the argument goes, well, there has to be some little man in your man mind who's doing that processing, right? who's perceiving that, that fried, egg, fried egg that's in your mind. Well, but then how is he perceiving? Well, there must be a little man in his mind also perceiving, and so on and so on and so on. Don't go down that path. <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, this, this is the problem. It's that path that is like, well, am I watching TV? If I'm watching TV and they're watching TV, and they're, it's like, no, it's an infinity. <laughs> yeah, I mean, just, I mean this, is, this is why people want to say that the Cartesian model is not good. Uh, the idea that what I'm doing is constructing an internal representation in my brain. Um, the idea is that this is mistaken. In fact, I'm not constructing an internal representation in my brain. What I'm doing is I'm constructing an action. Right? What I'm trying to do is figure out what to do. I need some representations of my brain in order to construct that action, but the goal isn't a perfect model of the world. Right? Um, what the goal is, is to accomplish the task that I have. Um, so in other words, how effective is it? Right? Not, not how accurate or how truthful it is, but how effective in accomplishing goals. Uh, I'm emphasizing this because finite state machines can accomplish goals also. Right? Fin finite state machines are agents in exactly this sense. So, yes, yeah, so let, uh, let me lay out some ground rules. So the question, can machines think? Um, so first of all, computers are agents. Computers are agents in the sense that they do things. They, they, they perform actions. Um, they perform computations. Those computations are designed to achieve some goal. They have a program that they're running. The fact that they have a program that they're running uh, makes them agents. It doesn't make them human agents. So there's lots of differences between the kind of agents that computers are, the kind of agents that humans are. Um, but which of those differences matter? Does it matter if they have conscious experience? Do they have to have emotions to be intelligent? Right? If we're asking the general question, can machines think? Right? What matters to whether or not they can think? You know, maybe you think that you, they have to have consciousness, so they have to have an emotional a capacity for emotions. And if they don't have a capacity for emotions, then they're not really thinking. Um, you know, they have goals, but maybe their goals aren't really their goals in the way that my goals are my goals, right? I decide my own goals, right? I'm an autonomous agent, uh, but a computer can't decide its own goals. It's given the goals by a program, you might think. Right, so does this difference matter? Um, also, always be thinking, well, how do I know that other humans have these capacities, right? How do I know that humans set their own goals? I, I think I set my own goals, but maybe I'm just wrong about that. Um, Right, so how do I know that anything sets its own goals? Right, so these are just sort of background questions that we have to be sensitive to when we're asking the question, can machines think? Um, I'm like way over time. I'm gonna keep running to this because this is the Turing test. This is like the, the critical thing. Uh, so Turing wants to give an answer to the question, can machines think? And he wants to give an answer that's scientifically respectable. That's not just making stuff up, or that can actually be put into a lab and tested. And his solution is to give what he what's called the Turing test. This is the Turing test set up right here. Um, the Turing test is a game. Turing calls it the imitation game. Uh, it's a game played between humans and machines. Um, one person here, labeled C, is the interrogator. And the interrogator is supposed to ask questions of a computer and a human, ask questions in natural language. And the goal is, to see, is for the interrogator to decide which is the human and which is the machine. Uh, the interrogator can ask any question it wants uh, for five minutes of questioning. And uh, if the interrogator can distinguish, if the interrogator can distinguish between the human and the machine, correctly identifies the computer and correctly identifies the human, if, the, if they can be distinguished, then Turing says the machine is not intelligent. But if the computer performs well enough that the interrogator gets the identification wrong, at least some of the time, and by some of the time Turing says 30%, so uh, if, if the interrogator gets the correct identification, gets, gets the identification wrong 30% uh, of the time, then we should consider intelligent. In other words, if the computer can convince a human being that it's human, if it can talk well enough to convince another human being that it's human, um, then we should consider it intelligent. So indistinguishability, right? So we can call this Turing's benchmark, indistinguishability from human performance. If the machine can perform at a human level so that we can't tell that machine apart from any other human, then we should also consider the machine intelligent. If you act enough like a human that we can't tell your computer, if you can pass for a human, then we should consider you intelligent. 
Why? Why should we consider you intelligent if you can behave like a human? Well, Turing's reasoning is grounded in fairness. Uh, he, t he talks about fair play for machines. So he says, look, when I judge a, hu a human being to be intelligent, I judge it on the basis of their behavior. Right? If, if, you know, if you're doing some things and I don't know if you're, you know, maybe you have some uh, mental health issue, uh, or maybe, maybe you're a normally functioning human being, but maybe you have some uh, cognitive uh, difficulty that makes it uh, imp impaired your uh, capacities. Well, how do I determine this? Well, in, in the simple case, the way to determine this is by talking to you. If I talk to you for five minutes, uh, I can uh, come to learn whether you're an intelligent, normally functioning human being, or if you're uh, significantly impaired in some way. Right? This is the test that we use on human beings. And so Turing says, fair play should be given to the machines. The same standards that we use to judge intelligence in human beings should be used to judge the intelligence in the machines. So if, if five minutes of questioning of a human being is enough to tell that they're intelligent, then let's spend five minutes questioning the machine. And if we can, if we can tell that the machine is clearly not intelligent, then it's not intelligent, right? It's clearly not human, clearly not intelligent. But if we can't tell it apart, if, uh, if we can't draw the distinction, then maybe we should consider the machine intelligent also. Because after all, it meets the same criteria as its human counterparts. So for instance, uh, uh, one of the requirements to get into college is to uh, do well in the SATs, or the ACTs, or the standardized tests. And doing well in standardized tests is one of the tests we use to judge the intelligence of a student and how well they're going to perform at school. Well, we have artificial intelligence systems that can perform better than a high school student at uh, a standardized test. That includes not just the mathematics, but also uh, writing. They can write essays that uh, are better, better written, uh, better structured than uh, a human uh, high school student. So if we use this test to judge the intelligence of high school students, then we should use the same test to judge the intelligence of the machines. The fact that these machines can pass these tests suggests that we should treat them as intelligent as a high school student. That doesn't mean they can do everything that a high school student can do, but look, here's one of the tests we use to judge the intelligence of a high school student, and the machine can pass those tests with flying colors. So out of fairness, we should hold them to the same standards. This is what Turing's really worried about. He's worried that we have a prejudice against the machine, that we don't think machines can think. So as soon as we learn that we're talking to a machine, we immediately believe that it's not a thinking thing. You know, that's just a trick, that's just a gimmick. What Turing's worried about here is a systematic prejudice against the machine. So the Turing test is designed to try to counteract this prejudice, right? You put the human in the computer behind a wall so I can't see them, I can only talk to them. Um, and uh, only in natural language, right? So uh, purely linguistic. Uh, uh, I can use the same kind of procedure to determine whether I'm talking to a, uh, you know, when I'm on customer service with Amazon, for instance, you know, sometimes it's an automated response and sometimes it's an actual human being talking to you. And after talking to a few seconds, you can, you can tell the difference. Um, so this is Turing's test. If you can distinguish between the human and the machine, then the machine is intelligent. But if you can't distinguish, if the machine hits indistinguishability, the benchmark of human performance, then we should consider this machine intelligent. Uh, just on the basis of fair play, I give uh, more discussion of fair play on the thing, and fair play is also the secret word for today. So I want to use that there. Uh, so Turing proposes the test as a way of deciding whether something's intelligent, and he likes this better than the original question, can machines think, or can computers think? Um, because there's going to be a lot of controversy over whether computers can think if we just leave this sort of uh, abstract. You know, what is thinking? Philosophers have been arguing for thousands of years about what is thinking. Um, we're not going to resolve what is thinking. In particular, I don't need to know what thinking is to judge that you're intelligent. Right? I don't know how thinking works. Right? I don't know how the brain works. But I know that you're intelligent, and I know that you're intelligent from, from interacting with you. Uh, so, it seems unreasonable to, to Turing argues, it seems unreasonable to demand that we define thinking explicitly in order to decide whether computers can think, because I decide that humans think all the time, even though I don't have a definition of thinking, right? So it can't be a definition of thinking that motivates uh, the judgment that something is thinking. It must be something else. And Turing says, well, it must be their behavior. So the Turing test is a, is a scenario where you can engage the behavior of the machine directly. And, and see if it passes the test. Okay, there's a lot more to say here, but um, 
let me go over some objections. So uh, Turing's test itself, uh, the computer machine intelligence paper, he proposes the Turing test. Um, and then basically after that, he goes over a bunch of objections to the Turing test. Um, uh, one of the objections is the Lady Lovelace objection. I'll get to it in a second. Let me first just mention Searle's Chinese room. Uh, Searle, 1980, long after Turing was gone, uh, proposes a thought experiment called the Chinese room thought experiment. In the Chinese room thought experiment, you get inputs. So uh, here's Searle in this room. Uh, Searle speaks English. He speaks German and French a little bit, but he doesn't know anything about Chinese. He doesn't speak a word of Chinese. He can't recognize any Chinese characters. Um, but he's in this room, uh, and this room has a couple of resources. In particular, it has this little rule book. Um, and what the rule book tells you are, are rules that look like this. So the rules are written in English. If you see this shape, followed by this shape, followed by this shape, then produce this shape, followed by this shape. The rules are written in English, so Searle, because Searle can speak English, Searle can follow these rules. Um, and in order to do the Chinese characters, all Searle has to do is just pattern match, right? So as long as you, you can find that same shape in the Chinese signal, uh, in the Chinese letter, then you can follow this rule. Following this rule, so this is not a translation of the Chinese, right? This doesn't tell you what the Chinese means. Um, but what it does tell you is what to put on the output, given some input. So you imagine the Chinese room has an input screen where Chinese characters are written on the input screen. Um, and then your job is to follow the rules to generate some output. If the rules are sophisticated enough, if the rule book is sophisticated enough, then the output that you put here um, will be uh, uh, sensible responses to this input. So the input are questions written in Chinese, um, and the output are responses to those questions, also written in Chinese. Um, and there are appropriate responses to those questions given the input. And if the rule book is good enough, then you can create a bunch of rules that do this kind of association. <coughs> so Searle says, look, I can follow these kinds of rules. So I can put the right outputs given the right inputs. And if the rule book is good enough, then anyone outside of the room is going to think that whatever's inside the room can speak Chinese. Because look, I asked it a question in Chinese, and it gave me the sensible Chinese response. So the fact that the room the input and output relationships look just like you would expect from a Chinese speaker. Uh, but inside the room, there's no Chinese understanding at all, so it says. So it says, the only thing that I understand is English. I don't understand Chinese at all. And following these rules doesn't help me understand Chinese at all any better. All I'm doing is matching shapes to other shapes, but they might as well be meaningless squiggles and squaggles, he says. So, Professor, just to go basically in a nutshell of what uh, Stirling's Chinese room, Searle? basically, yeah. uh, what's it called? I mean, this comes back to process validation, Six Sigma and stuff. You're using inputs and outputs. If you can put an input and your outputs come out okay, you can ver you can um, your verifications are good, but your validations don't pass because the validation is well. It's I mean, in the processes, it's what it's matching your okay. customers. Uh, come in. Go ahead. Uh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, come, come in. Come in. Can you give me like another 10 minutes or is that? Okay, yeah, no, I just, I, I thought yeah. you were done for 10 yeah. minutes. Yeah, yeah, like 15 minutes maybe, yeah, yeah. Okay. Good, good. okay. But as I was saying, and just to be quick, what's it called? Your verifications passed because you put inputs in it and your outputs came in and you verified that's what you wanted. You can't validate it because validation, again, going into processes, is going back to what the customer's need is. And in this case, the customer need was, oh, I need you to speak Chinese and stuff. Yeah. So you can't prove, so just an interesting thing I saw out of that. So. Yeah, no, no, that's very good. So, so what the Chinese room has is it has the right input-output relationships. So, so, uh, so it's doing the right thing. It's doing what you expect to do, at least at that level. But maybe the stuff inside isn't the right stuff. Right? If we want Chinese understanding, you don't actually have that insight, so it's not uh, a passing that way. So... Uh, so it says there's no Chinese understanding, but there is rule following. And then he says, but look, this is what computers do. All, a computer knows how to follow the rules. It can take inputs, map them to some output. Um, that kind of formal process is computation. But computation isn't enough for understanding, because look, here's Searle doing that same kind of computation, but Searle doesn't understand Chinese at all. So Searle says that computers can only do this kind of processing, you know, sy syntactic processing. But that syntactic processing is never sufficient for semantics, for the meanings of the words. And since you don't get the meanings of the words, you don't actually have Chinese understanding. You don't actually know what any of the words mean. So uh, Searle's 
room is supposed to be an objection to the Turing test because the room passes the Turing test. It behaves just like a human being, right? If you can execute the rules fast enough, then if you're standing outside the room, it looks like the room speaks Chinese, right? Uh, it passes the Turing test. It behaves just like any other human Chinese speaker. But inside, uh, there's no understanding at all. So, so Cyril uses this as an example of how passing the Turing test isn't enough for intelligence. Even if you do all the right things, even if you behave in all the right ways, you still might not be intelligent. I have a lot more to say about this, but I'll, I'll let you guys go ahead and talk about this online. Uh, I just want to wrap up really quickly. Uh, one last objection. Um, Lady Lovelace has a different kind of objection. Um, so Cyril says that, look, there's some things that brains do, like understanding, that machines can't do. Lovelace doesn't have that objection. Lovelace's argument is that machines can do whatever we tell them to do, right? Um, machines can, so she says, machines do whatever we know how to order to perform. Uh, this is Lovelace talking about the analytical engine with Babbage, right? In her notes to Babbage, she says, the analytical engine can do whatever we know how to order to perform. It can follow analysis, but it has no power of anticipating any analytical relations or truths, right? So it only does what we tell it to do, and it doesn't do anything beyond that. So when Turing talks about Lovelace's objection, he says that, uh, Turing, uh, sorry, what Lovelace is saying is that machines only do what we tell them to do, or that machines only do what they're programmed to do. This is a very common objection to artificial intelligence, that the machine isn't really doing it itself. We're telling the machine to do whatever it does, right? It's doing it as a result of its programming. And because it's doing it as a result of its programming, it's not really the agent involved. We're really the agent involved. And the computer is just kind of like a, a sophisticated assistant. Right? So when I program, you know, a computer to play chess, I'm writing that program, so in some sense, I'm really the one that's playing chess, and the computer is just to sort of uh, helping me do it. But the computer doesn't really play chess. Uh, the computer is only doing what I tell it to do. It doesn't have any idea what it's doing, it's just doing what I tell it to do. Lovelace admits that machines can do all sorts of incredible things. They can do all sorts of really sophisticated processing. What Lovelace denies, so she's not objecting to machines thinking in the sense of doing things, um, but what Lovelace denies is that machines do it autonomously, that they're self-directing in their actions. So autonomy, uh, auto means law, and nomos means law, I'm uh, sorry, auto means self, and nomos means law. So autonomy is self-law giving or self-governing. And what Lovelace is saying is that machines can't be autonomous. Machines always depend on us for their programs. Um, they can't do whatever they want. They have to do what we want because we're programming them. A lot of people object to artificial intelligence because it's programmed. Um, but Turing gives a response that I think is a convincing response. Uh, Turing responds to Lovelace by saying, well, well, look, if you want a machine that does, that behaves on its own and not just what we tell it to do, then build machines that learn. This is in 1950. He says, build learning machines. Because if you build a machine that learns, then the result of its learning process, I mean, I mean the, what it does is the result of its learning process. And that learning process is something that it went through and not the programmer. Right, so uh, if I'm teaching you how to do a long division problem, um, you say you don't know how to do long division, you've never learned it before, I'm teaching you how to do it the first time, uh, f f for the first time. So the first time we walk through a problem, you know, I have to walk you through every step of the process. You don't really know what you're doing, I know what I'm doing, so I'm walking you through the step of the process. Did you do it on your own that time? No, I, I mostly did it. Right, I sort of basically told you what to do. But if we do this enough times, we do it 40 or 50 times, then eventually you catch on to how it works. And I know you catch on, I know you've learned how to do it when you can do it yourself, right? This is why we test students, right? I give you a test so that you do it by yourself or without me hand, holding your hand to demonstrate that you can do it on your own. Now, notice that when you do a long division problem, right? So when I teach you long division and then you do a problem on your own, everything that you do in that problem uh, is the result of the algorithms that I gave you, right? So I know exactly what you're doing at every step of the way. There, there's no mystery about what you're doing. Um, but I still say that you did it and not me, even though I know what you're doing uh, because, it's, because uh, I wasn't holding your hand while you did it, right? You, you were the one who actually worked through the problem. And it's because you were the one who worked through the problem that I say that you've learned and I judge you to be intelligent. If you can you know, do a long division problem on your own, you're uh, intelligent to some degree. Um, and uh, that intelligence isn't because you've come up with some radically new way of doing long division. You're doing the same algorithm everyone else is doing, but you can do it autonomously. You can do it on your own. So Turing says, if we can build machines that can learn to do things on their own, then they, they escape Lovelace's objection. A machine that learns how to do something on its own isn't just doing what it's programmed to do, but it's doing what it's learned to do. And that learning is a result of its own uh, history. Um, 
Oh, I have so much more I want to talk about, but this is the last thing I want to do. I, to talk about the neural networks that are popular today. Um, on, on, the, on the Prezi, I have uh, one more slide here, or I put some robots on, and the robot, I'll put some more uh, later on, but the robots are all robots that I have linked on the Moodle page. Um, but the one thing I want, to, I want to just walk through really quickly because it's really awesome um, is the neural networks that we use today. So uh, I want to give just a brief dem demonstration of how these neural networks work. So this is a neural network, art artificial neural network. Artificial neural networks are based on uh, biological neural networks. So your brain is a neural network. And the way neural networks work is that it's made of nodes. And each node in itself is pretty dumb. It can't do very much itself. But the nodes are connected up together with a bunch of other nodes. And the way that they're connected, the patterns of connections, uh, give rise to the intelligent behavior. So uh, for this uh, neural network, is, this is the input layer, a bunch of nodes at the input. Every node in every layer is connected to every node in the next layer. So this node is connected to every single node in the next layer. And then this node is connected to every single node in the next layer. And same thing for all the other nodes. Right. This is, it's called a feed-forward network because these are the inputs and then it just moves in one direction. It moves from the inputs to the outputs. Uh, and when I say moves, here's what I mean. Right? So when you put in an input, you give each of these nodes a value, some value. Um, and then the values for the hidden nodes um, are going to be the every node in the previous layer times the connection strength. So this node is connected to this node by this connection. And then the way in a neural network, this connection has a weight, has uh, some value associated with that connection called a weight. And so what you do is uh, to, f to determine the value of this hidden layer node, I first take this node times this weight, plus 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 this node times this weight. Times this weight. Right, so each node in the previous layer times the connection strength between that node and the node that we're trying to figure out. Right, then you add up all those values, and then that gives you the value for this, this hidden layer node. You do that for all the hidden layer nodes in every single layer, and then you keep doing this all the way to the very end until you get some value in the output. Your value of the output is, is the answer to the problem. So you give the machine inputs, and then uh, the values feed through the network until they reach an output. Um, so if you do this one time, uh, you're probably not going to get the right output. Um, and the way that these neural networks usually start is that you start off with randomized weights. So you have a bunch of random uh, values for the connection strings. So you give it some input, uh, random values means you can get a random output. That output's going to be completely random, just uh, uh, it's not going to have very much meaning at all. But uh, what you do, so you, you run the values through once, and then you take the value at the end, and you compare it to the value that it should have gotten on that input. Right, so uh, I, know what, I know what the answer to that input is. Uh, here's the correct answer, and here's the answer that the network gave me. And what I do is I compare these two, the, the correct answer and the answer the network gave me. I take the difference between the two, and I use that difference to adjust all the weights in the network. So I go back through the network. This is an algorithm called backpropagation. So once I get the output value, I determine how far away that is from the correct value, and I use that difference to adjust, to make small little adjustments to these weights. And then I use that again to make small little adjustments to these weights, and back here. So the network starts off with completely random weights, but then every time you go through the network, you make these small adjustments so that it's more likely to give the correct output. And you do this hundreds and hundreds of times right, on, a, on a training set. You, you train it with lots and lots of data. Uh, the end result of that training process is a network that's fine-tuned to solving that task. Um, and you can prove mathematically that this kind of process will build systems that will solve any computable function. So a neural network like this is as computationally powerful as a Turing machine. Uh, but you don't program the weights, right? You train the weights. You have to let the, the system learn, and it learns how these weights work. So this is the general idea for a neural network. Uh, right now, neural networks are, are blowing up. They're really uh, trendy. So there's been lots of variations of how these things are built. And here's the perceptron, we talked about that before, this old sort of network, these feed-forward networks. The example that I just gave you is an example of a deep feed-forward network where you have uh, input node and then a couple of hidden layers and an output layer. Uh, that's the simplest kind of uh, neural network. Um, you have these more sophisticated kinds with different kinds of processing. And all of this is about what the nodes do 
and how they're connected up. So in recurrent networks, you have these little recursive loops in the hidden nodes. Um, really popular one nowadays are these convolutional networks. Convolutional networks have certain kinds of processing that takes place at these uh, convolutional nodes. I mean, those nodes are integrated with other kinds of uh, feed-forward networks. Um, so you can get all sorts of uh, interesting processes working fast. Um, not only are we building software to do these uh, interesting kind of nodes, but we're starting to build hardware. So this stuff has become so popular uh, that we we're starting to build specialty hardware that runs these kinds of neural networks um, because they're becoming so useful that we need, I mean, it's very computationally intensive to do a, a, a network like this because you have to compare every node and every weight. It's a lot of uh, co computations. Um, so if we're doing this at the software level and our computers are these sort of stepwise linear uh, computations, um, then it's going to go really slowly. Uh, so the solution is to uh, start building these very sophisticated networks into the hard, bake it into the hardware itself. Um, so we're starting to build customized hardware. You're going to start seeing it pop up in your phone and so on, uh, customized hardware for doing AI. And what they're doing is they're building in uh, computational resources for computing these networks very quickly. So here's an example. Here's one, one example, and I want to do an actual demonstration. It's how a neural network sees, right? So there's an input, here's the image. The task here is to identify what kind of car it is. So you put the input on the image, and by input I mean like take each pixel, there's a color value for each pixel, um, give each node uh, one pixel's worth of color values, um, and then hook all of those nodes to every single node in the next layer, and do that for several layers. So uh, these first few layers, you're not gonna have anything very interesting. You're not gonna really get anything interesting until the very end. But you can think of these intermediate layers as sort of internal representations of more or less sophistication. So uh, the first slice of this image sort of breaks it up into just lines and colors, black or white, and then sort of the orientation of that line. Not a whole lot of information being captured here, but this is just the beginning. Uh, the more layers you have, the more abstract relationships you can start considering. So by, by this point, you know, several layers in, uh, here are the internal states of the machine, and you can see that it can sort of pick out wheels, and those are very clearly wheels. That looks like a window. Right, so this is much more abstract, sophisticated feature detection for an image like this. And then here at the very end, you have very high-level feature detection, where I mean, these very clearly look like cars. And the combination of these networks all working together allows the network to get the right response. Um, so I, I want to sh show you an actual uh, instance of this. Uh, what a real neural network looks like. I want to show you an actual thinking machine. And, and, and then I'll stop it right there. Uh, yeah, so lesson 12 at the very end. So I have uh, the readings require and optional readings. Um, and then I have just a big list of uh, robots. Um, and uh, newest ones I just added right here. Uh, first thing, just you should play with this. Uh, Google just released a bunch of AI experiments. These are little games you can play with an AI. Um, some of them, Quick Draw is really fun, um, but it shows you how sophisticated this stuff gets. Uh, let me just show you Quick Draw just really quickly. Uh, it's Quick Draw. Um, it asks you to draw something, so it wants me to draw lightning. So I'm going to draw lightning. Uh, that's really terrible. And then, you, and then it guesses. Um, so, yeah, so it's making guesses. Um, these guesses aren't pretty good, but I'm a bad drawer. So, yeah, so, uh, so this, is a, this is a good resource for uh, interacting with some of these deep neural networks. But the best thing by far, and this is, what I, this is the last demo, um, is this, Neural networks. This is the TensorFlow program, TensorFlow play Playground. So TensorFlow is the library, uh, the software library for Google's deep learning uh, applications. This is the uh, language that they use to write all their deep learning applications. Um, AlphaGo, the, uh, Alpha, uh, the Go playing robot, was built on TensorFlow. Um, so are almost all of Google's uh, neural network projects. Um, it's open source, anyone can use the same software and build their own AI uh, for themselves. And Google has given a bunch of resources for uh, sort of explaining how these things work. So this is the TensorFlow Playground, and what this shows you is a real neural network that'll run on my browser. So this is the, this is the network. Um, here's the input nodes, um, and then you have 
Uh, hidden layers, right now this has two hidden layers. First one has four nodes, the second one has two nodes. I can add more hidden layers if I want, although it gets computationally expensive. Um, I can take away layers, I can adjust these layers in all sorts of different ways. I can put more nodes on a layer if I want. So there's lots of different ways of adjusting this thing. And the task is to do a classification of this data set. So we have four different data sets we can use, but I'll start with this one. So here's a data set. Um, there's some blue dots in this data set. There's some orange dots in this data set. And what we want this network to do is to uh, draw a line in this space that uh, separates out the blue dots from the orange dots. And we're going to do this using a neural network. And just like I described it, right, there's these hidden layers. And what happens is we're adjusting these weights. So these little dashed lines uh, between the nodes are the connection strengths. And you'll see that as we run this, some connections get stronger and other connections get weaker until it finds the optimal solution to this problem. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to start it off with a random seed. I'm going to hit run. And what you're seeing here is the computer trying to figure out the best way of capturing just those blue dots. And it looks like it got it. What you just saw was a computer thinking. That computer solved that problem on its own. Um, let, me, let me do it again. Uh, so, so don't just look at the, the output here. Right? You see the circle. But also look at these weights and see which ones are getting bigger and which ones are getting smaller. Which neurons are the important neurons for solving this task? All right, so it got it, it, got, it, got it pretty fast. Um, notice that most of the connection strings are coming out of these, neuro, these, these bottom neurons. This one right here isn't adding very much to the mix. But these ones are doing most of the work. Um, let me try a more difficult one. Um, so again, data sets, I want to separate out the orange and the blue. This is a much more complicated data set, right? They're clustered in a much more complicated way. Uh, drawing a line between those two, it's going to be very difficult. Not really. It, oh, yeah, I mean, I, you obviously got to know what, if you've done research on it, you kind of know that already in the past. What that is actually is um, part of a Fibonacci um, circle, if I'm correct, if that's the right name, or a Fibonacci sequence. You heard of that before? Yeah. So yeah, that, that, might, that might have some application here, yeah. So with that, you can know, it's like, hey, I could see, you know, well, with using mathematics, let's say you had to draw that out or do something to collect, you can know, hey, I have to file at least this type of patterns. Yeah, that. yeah, that's good, that's good. Yeah, so there's, there's some approaches that we might have to it. It's very abstract approaches. And the one you did before and stuff, that kind of reminds me, in real world, um, I guess, plays, you'll see that in um, process validation. I said that name before. Yeah. Whereas where you want to, uh, if you do a, uh, what's it called? If you install, let's just say an oven or something, right? For some industry and stuff. And you're trying to, and you're making stuff. Let's say Nabisco, you're making cookies, you install an oven. You got to see if it works right. And if it performs to the best of its ability and stuff. And you can do these certain tests, just like with the um, tan and the, or the orange and the blue. And you see, hey, at this point, we're consistently always going to perform at this rate and stuff. Yeah. Well, good. and then you can adjust that and stuff. So in that manner, it's good for those applications. Yeah. Uh, good. And uh, I mean, in general, this is sort of an optim optimization algorithm. Yeah. To make sure that we get the right values for each case. So let me, let me give this more sophisticated problem. So this data set is just part of the problem here is that it's nonlinear. You can't just draw a single line to, to cut off one side from the other. So uh, you have to draw this curved spiral. So let's, let's see the computer struggle with this for a bit. So it's not doing very well at all. It has like a little bit of a curve. And you can, hopefully you can see it changing slightly. Right? So start, oh, am I yeah. still? Yeah, I'm still on. It's starting to curve, yeah. Just like it's starting to follow the uh, sequence. Yeah, a little bit. Um, it takes, I mean, obviously it's not as easy as the first one. But it's still, you know. Yeah, and you can see it making adjustments to try to improve this, but it's not really getting any better. So let, let, me, let me run this again. So every time you start it, it gets a different seed starting place. Uh, and that helps it. So one of, the, one of the problems that you get in these systems is that they end up getting locked into a certain configuration. And then any adjustment from that configuration is, uh, makes it worse off. So it's not an optimal configuration, but it's also you can't make it any better uh, with very simple moves. So, so here, it looks like we're getting stuck in that same configuration here where it's sort of 
it gets this little bit of orange, it gets this little bit of blue, but the rest of it doesn't really work. Oh no, we're still moving, we're still moving. But I kind of get what you're saying too. Um, do you remember, um, you, you took calculus, right, in college? Do you remember a thing called Newton's method? Yeah. Do you remember where if you were trying to find a wavelength, I, I don't know if it was like, if you're trying to find the zero point or a derivative, you would have to use Newton's method. And what that did was it would approach the point you wanted. But sometimes if there was different points on, let's say there was five different points and you wanted the fourth one, sometimes Newton method might go towards the third one. So this is kind of what the computer's doing. It's not being efficient. It's really, you tell it to do something, but it's really not accomplishing what you want it done. Yeah, it, it doesn't know how to, and, and you can see here, right? So, I mean, it's getting all, all these orange ones look like they're correct, but then all these orange ones over here are not correct. Are not, yeah. Yes, right, so, so it, it's doing okay. It's, it's better than nothing, but it's not completely getting it right. And part of the challenge is that it gets stuck in this, in this state, and it, it's hard for it to get out of the state. And one thing you can do to improve this is by raising the noise. So here I raise the noise to 10%. Uh, what the noise does is it throws some randomness into the mix. And what the randomness does is it sometimes knocks it out of these places where it gets stuck. And this makes it easier to find the optimal solution. So I'm going to go ahead and run this. Um, and you'll see that the noise will make it a little more active. Uh, it'll be changing more often. But what, what, you're seeing, what you're seeing here is a computer thinking. What you're seeing is a computer uh, trying to adjust its behavior to better optimize its goals. I um, mean, it's doing it uh, on its own. It's doing it automatically. Um, I, I, I gave it the goal to do, but it's learning how to uh, meet that goal on its own. Uh, this didn't seem to work very well. Let me go ahead and turn on more inputs. So part of the problem here is I'm only having linear inputs. Um, I have some hidden layers, so that makes it better. But maybe if I add some... Uh, Nonlinear inputs, um, it'll help. Yeah, so here we're gonna see more activity. Um, because now, the, now it has more things to work with, it has more states to sort of move around. And you, can, you see it sort of flashing back and forth between these states, this is sort of indecision uh, in the computer. It's trying to optimize this, it's trying to find exactly the optimal path. And it'll jitter around in the space, uh, sort of trying to bring these two little bubbles of blue together. And it might get it if I let it sit here for long enough. It might just sort of wobble back and forth between these two states. But the point here is I wanted to show you that this, this machine thinking, and you can actually watch it thinking in real time, where right? you're watching it, adjusting its behavior, to try to uh, accomplish this goal. Um, being able to play with something like this in your browser is amazing. I've been talking about neural networks since 2006. Um, and every time I've done it, I've had to write on the chalkboard, like draw out little neural networks, try to explain how they work in that sense. And you not comfortable with math, it's a little bit difficult. But here you can actually play with it and you can tweak all the little parameters, see, see how it does. You can change the nature of the network um, and really get your hands dirty with, with, with how it works. So um, this is basically all I wanted to talk about. Um, play with these, go look at these robots, play with some of these experiments. Um, I uh, did put some uh, documentaries in the required readings. Um, I put one of the required readings is the Great Robot Race, which was uh, the DARPA challenge from 2005 for automated vehicles. Uh, and some of the quiz questions, the reason I'm pointing those is because some of the quiz questions come from this documentary. Um, the people who worked on the automated cars back in 2005 are, are now employees for Google, and you know, all, the, all the automated cars that are coming onto the roads right now were built by the people who were participating in these challenges back a decade ago. So this is, gives you good insight into how automated driving works and uh, sort of the technology here. Um, I also have a documentary on Watson. Uh, IBM's Watson is the other documentary here. And I think there's questions in the quiz from that documentary also. And then I just have a bunch of robots. Uh, we can talk more about these robots uh, next week maybe uh, in lecture, but I, I've already gone over two hours, so I wanna go ahead and stop right now. Um, but uh, check out these robots, talk about this stuff online. I'd love to hear your thoughts about whether machines can think, what the consequences of machines thinking are. Um, uh, try to keep it as philosophical as possible, but also try to keep it as grounded in the science as possible. You know, do some research, look up uh, what psychologists know, what cognitive scientists know about how the brain works, what neuroscientists know about how the brain works. Um, don't just talk about uh, science fiction movies. 
Um, so uh, this time we're sort of free, free to talk about any aspect of artificial intelligence that you want. Next time we'll talk about um, weapons, drones, and we'll talk a little bit more about social robots. Um, and then uh, week 14, our last full lesson is technological employment, uh, robots taking our jobs. Um, yeah, so I'm going to go and stop there. Uh, thanks very much, Glenn, for all your participation and contribution. No problem. Um, it's, it's a lot. It's really a lot of stuff to go over just this week. It, it just gets really deep. So yeah, and there's and there's um, there's a lot of parts to this that I wanted to uh, hit on. Um, the, a lot of the a lot of the stuff. I just maybe just say this one more time. A lot of the stuff dealing with computers. Uh, because I know a lot of you are computer scientists taking a lot of programming classes know how computers work in general. But what I really want you to think about is the relationship between computers and agency, between computers and goal acquisition, right? Not just the experiences that the computer has, but what, that, uh, what the programs allow the computer to do. Because uh, my, my own views are that it's really agency that, that we think of when we, when we talk about thinking. I mean, not just sensations or emotions or experiences, but really goal acquisition, being able to do things. Um, so think about computers in that sense. Uh, okay, I'm going to stop now. Uh, thanks, Lynn. Uh, I'm logging okay. off. Okay, take care. Uh, see you next week. Have a good Thanksgiving. You too. Thank you.